From London, we present the Francis Durbridge serial, Paul Temple and the Jonathan Mystery. Episode 1, The Fergusons. Feeling tired, Steve? No, not a bit. I'm just excited. <laughs> You've been excited ever since the plane left New York. It's the thought of going home. What time do we arrive in London? About nine o'clock. So relax. Oh, I've got a thirst. Let's go to the little lounge and have a drink. Hmm? Mm, by all means. Pardon me, but I think you're sitting on my magazine. Oh, I, I'm so sorry. Uh, no, please, don't get up. But I'm sure I've got your seat. No, no, really. Oh, well, sit down, Robert, and don't make such a fuss. I'm not making a fuss, Helen. We're flying the Atlantic. This isn't a bus on Fifth Avenue. I guess there's plenty of seats for everybody. Well, there won't be if you put your magazines on them. <laughs> Trust my wife to have the last word. Uh, by the way, my name's Ferguson, Robert Ferguson. Oh, mine's Temple. This is my wife. How do you do? Yeah. Uh, not Paul Temple. Uh, yes, I'm afraid so. Oh, darling, I knew I was right. I told you, didn't I? I recognized you at the airport, Mr. Temple. Oh. I never forget a face, do I, Robert? Never? She thought you were Cary Grant. <laughs> <laughs> I wish he was Cary Grant. <laughs> Is this your first trip to England? Oh, no, I've been over many times. My wife lived in London until we were married. Are you coming over on business, Mr. Ferguson? Well, not entirely. We've, um, we've got a boy at Oxford. He'll be 21 the day after tomorrow. Uh, nice. Uh, what college? Uh, he's at Magdalen. Oh, that's my old college. <laughs> Is that so? Do you hear that, Helen? Mr. Temple was at Magdalen. Yes, I heard, darling. Um, here's a, a photograph of Richard and Mrs. Temple. It was taken last year. Oh, he's a good-looking boy, Mrs. Ferguson. <laughs> you must be very proud of him. We are. He, um... He doesn't look very American, does he? Well, you can hardly call him an American, Mrs. Temple. He's been at school in England since he was 12. But Richard adores England. Yeah, you can say that again. Every time we suggest he comes back to the States, we come over to England. <laughs> <laughs> What's he going to do when he comes down? Well, I, I think he's going to be a writer. His letters are full of books he's read and things he's written. Yeah. Oh, I know what you want, Robert. <laughs> you want him to go into that dreary old business of yours... But I don't believe in forcing a boy into doing anything he doesn't want to do. It's a great mistake. Don't you agree, Mrs. Temple? Well... If Richard wants to be a writer, okay, he's a writer. Mm -hmm. But if he does decide to go into the old firm, well, it would make me very happy. Yeah, well, he won't go into the old firm. You know he won't. No. Well, I ask you, Mrs. Temple, fancy sending a boy to Oxford and then putting him in the furniture business. Now, <laughs> listen. Excuse me, sir, your drinks. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. Steve? Thank you, Dan. Uh, will you and Mrs. Ferguson join us? Oh, that's very kind of you, but uh, we've got ours here. Oh. Well, here's to a pleasant trip, Mr. Ferguson. Thank yeah. you. And to your son, Richard. Yes. Happy birthday. Oh, oh that's, that's kind of you. Mighty kind. Thank you, Mrs. Temple. To Richard. 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 Anything else to declare, sir? No, no, that's... Uh, there's nothing else. Thank you. Thank you. All right, sir. Oh, there's Charlie. Mm, where? Hello, Charlie. Good morning, Mrs. Oh, hello, Charlie. Good morning, sir. Welcome home. Thank you, Charlie. Have you got the car? Yes, sir. It's all ready, sir. Everything's okay. To... <laughs> on the beam, sir. Good. <laughs> I'll take the zip, Mrs. T. You hang on to the hat hops. Morning, Mr. Temple. Hello, Inspector. Have you just arrived from New York? Yes. Uh, do you know my wife, Inspector? Darling, this is Inspector Gerard, one of Sir Graham's bright boys. How do you do? How do you do, Mrs. Temple? You say you've just flown in from New York? Yes. On flight 508? Yes, that's right. Well, you must have travelled over with a Mr. and Mrs. Ferguson. Yes, we did. 
What does he look like? Uh, that's Ferguson over there, the tall man with the brown overcoat. Are you looking for them? Yes. Why? I'm afraid I've got some very bad news for them. Oh? Last night, their son was murdered. I agree with what you say about the Nelson girl, Inspector. On the other hand, if she was in love with the fellow... Mm. Yes, what is it, Sergeant? Mr. Temple, sir. Hello, Sir Graham. Good afternoon, Inspector. Good afternoon. Well, well, you look fit, Temple. Did you have a successful trip? Yes, very, thank you. How's Steve? Well, at the moment, she can't make up her mind whether she's in London or New York. No, I'm not surprised. <laughs> Sit down. Ah, oh, thanks. <laughs> the Inspector tells me that you flew over from New York with a uh, Mr. and Mrs. Ferguson. Yes, that's right, we did. Their son. Yes, I know. Look, Sir Graham, it's no good beating about the bush. I'm interested in this Ferguson case. That's why I'm here. Well, what can we do for you, Temple? Well, so far, I know very little about the case. I'd like to know exactly what happened. Yes, that's what we'd like to know, exactly what happened. Well, let me have the facts. Assume I know nothing whatever about the case. Go on, Inspector. Well, Richard Ferguson was a student at Oxford, Magdalen College. Although he hadn't a large circle of friends... He appears to have been reasonably popular and, as far as we can gather, had no enemies. Hmm. He lived in a self-contained flat which was actually the top floor of a house in Mortimer Close. Mortimer Close is in a residential part of Oxford, about a mile and a half from the college. <laughs> yes, I know. Go on, Inspector. Well, the house belongs to a Mrs Gulliver. Well, on the night of the murder, she went out to the pictures and met Richard just as she was leaving the house. According to Mrs. Gulliver, the boy seemed nervous and ill at ease, and he told her that he had a dinner date for eight o'clock with a girl called Dinah Nelson. Dinah Nelson? Well, to cut a long story short, Richard didn't keep that date. Miss Nelson waited from eight o'clock until approximately a quarter past nine. Go on. Mrs. Gulliver returned from the pictures just after ten. She heard no noise from the flat, and she assumed that Richard was still out with the girlfriend. The next morning, about half past seven, she took up his usual cup of tea. Uh, have you got the photograph, Sir Graham? Yes, here it is. When Mrs. Gulliver opened the bedroom door, Temple, this is what she saw. Good God! The boy was on the floor near the bed. He must have been shot at very close quarters because, as you can see, most of his face was almost completely blown away. Yes. Um... Who identified the body? Mrs. Gulliver, Dinah Nelson, and another friend of young Ferguson's called Mrs. Russell. However, just to be on the safe side, we made fingerprint tests of the dead man. The prints checked all right. They, they were Ferguson's. Hmm. Have you any idea of the time of the murder? The medical people won't commit themselves. Might have been any time between seven when Mrs. Gulliver saw him and midnight. What about a motive? That's just the point. There doesn't appear to be a motive. Hmm. Was anything missing? Yes, a ring. Richard used to wear it on his little finger. Yes, but I doubt if the boy was murdered for a gold ring. No, it seems hardly likely, sir. There was a wallet in one of the drawers with 20-odd pounds in it. Yes? Well, I'm afraid that's about all. There was the postcard. Yes, but I doubt if that's really got anything to do with the case, sir. What postcard? The morning Mrs Gulliver discovered the body, one or two letters arrived for Richard and a postcard from Harrogate, which read, Having a wonderful time, regards, Jonathan. We checked up on the card just in case Jonathan, whoever he might be, was trying to establish an alibi. But none of Richard's friends seems to have heard of anyone called Jonathan. I see. Hmm. Well, now I'd better tell you what happened last night, Sir Graham. Yes? Ferguson phoned me about half past six and asked Steve and me to go round to their hotel. He sounded pretty excited, and when we got to the hotel, he gave me a copy of a magazine called The New Feature. Um, here it is. The new feature? Yes, it's a highbrow periodical. Mm hmm Go on. Well, the magazine, marked private and addressed to Mr and Mrs Ferguson, was at the hotel when the Fergusons arrived. On page 14, there's an article on the international situation by a writer called Europa. You'll notice that someone has underlined the name Europa and scribbled a footnote. Yes. And do you see what it says? If you want to know who murdered your son, ask... Europa. Well, who is Europa? It's obviously a non diplume. Mm, it's a non diplume, all right, but. Well, Ferguson showed me the magazine and asked me to find out who Europa was. 
He also asked me, or rather his wife did, if I would investigate the case. I said I would. Mm-hmm, yes. Well, we stayed talking until about half past ten, and then Steve and I left the hotel by the embankment entrance and strolled down past the gardens to the spot where I'd parked the car. But to my surprise, someone was sitting in it. Excuse me, but um, haven't you made a mistake? Uh, Mr. Temple? Yes? Please forgive me for sitting in your car, but I did want to see you, and and I was afraid I might miss you. I see, but... uh... I'm Dinah Nelson. I was a friend of Richard Ferguson's. But what are you doing here, in our car? Well, I wanted to talk to Mr. and Mrs. Ferguson. I was just going into the hotel when I saw you and Mr. Temple drive up. It was in the evening paper that you flew over from New York with the Ferguson's. No, wait a minute, wait a minute, Miss Nelson. Uh, You get in the back, Steve. I'll sit in front with Miss Nelson. Yes, all right, dear. Well, now, suppose you take a deep breath and start at the beginning. Mm. Thank you, Mrs. Temple. I was very friendly with Richard Ferguson. About 18 months ago, we became unofficially engaged. For about a year, we were terribly happy together. And then, quite suddenly, Richard's attitude changed towards me. How do you mean, changed? Well, he he used to write, you know. He wanted to be a writer and... Mm -hmm. Well, he suddenly got awfully cynical and, and, and bitter about things... He started criticising me. He started to compare me with a woman called Mavis Russell. Who was she? Oh, she was a friend of Richard's, a writer. She's friendly with quite a lot of the students. Her real name is Mavis Russell, but she writes under the name of Europa. Does she by Timothy? Go on, Miss Nelson. Well, to be quite candid, I don't like Mrs Russell. I never have liked her. Oh, I suppose I was jealous of her. But Mr Temple... I think she had an evil influence over Richard. Evil influence? Oh, I know proof, no real proof of what I'm saying, but I think that directly or indirectly she was responsible for his murder. Is that why you wanted to see the Fergusons? To tell them about Mrs. Russell? Yes. Have you told the police what you think? Yes, I saw Inspector Gerard last night. Well? Well, all he did was ask me a lot of silly questions about somebody I'd never even heard of. Somebody called Jonathan. Jonathan? Yes, Apparently, this person, Jonathan, sent Richard a picture postcard from Harrogate or somewhere, and the police can't account for it. As if it matters. Miss Nelson, what sort of a person is this Mrs. Russell? To meet, I mean. Oh, charming, good-looking, wealthy... When did you first meet her? Oh, about six months ago. My boss, Professor Dillwright, gave a cocktail party, and Mrs. Russell was one of the guests. I introduced her to Richard. Miss Nelson, tell me... Did you send a copy of the magazine, The New Feature, to Mr. Ferguson? The New Feature? No. Why do you ask? Well, because someone did. With an interesting footnote about Europa, alias Mavis Russell. Well, it wasn't me, Mrs. Temple. It wasn't me. Oh, and then you're not the only person who doesn't like Mrs. Russell. Well, that's what happened last night, Sir Graham. <laughs> After our talk, Miss Nelson decided that she couldn't face the Fergusons, so we took her home. She's staying with a married sister, a Mrs. Mackintosh, for two or three days. My dear Temple, it's perfectly obvious that Miss Nelson sent Ferguson the magazine and that her theory about Mrs. Russell is pure imagination. Most theories are imagination, Inspector. Have you seen Mrs. Russell? Yes, I have, and she's a very charming woman. Oh, no doubt. Temple, do you remember an old friend of yours called Red Harris? Yes, of course, but I'd hardly call him an old friend. Well, you did him a favour... A very big favour, remember? Obviously, that was a long time ago. I provided the evidence that proved he was innocent, that's all. But why mention Red Harris? Well, he spent three days in Oxford this week. He was there the night young Ferguson was murdered. Oh. Have you spoken to him? Yes. Well? Oh, he's got an alibi, a very good one. But I I thought I'd mention it, Temple. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll take this magazine down to Rogers and get a report on the handwriting, sir. Yes, all right, Inspector. Temple? Yes? If you don't think Miss Nelson sent this magazine to Ferguson, then who do you think did send it? Your guess is as good as mine, Inspector. Yes, but what is your guess? Well, it might have been Mrs Russell. Mrs Russell? Good heavens, man, she wouldn't throw suspicion onto herself. Wouldn't she? It has been done, Inspector.
Oh, hello, Steve. I'm sorry I'm late. I'll take your coat, darling. Oh, thank you. Aaron. Did you see Sir Graham? Yes, I've only just left the yard. Is there someone in the drawing room? Yes, it's Mr. Mackintosh. I Macintosh. told him you were out, but he insisted on waiting. He's some relation to Dinah Nelson. Well, how long has he been waiting? Only two or three minutes. Oh. All right. Let's see what it's all about. Oh, good evening, Mr. Temple. Good evening. Uh, my name's Mackintosh, Reggie Mackintosh. Oh, well, what can I do for you, Mr. Mackintosh? Well, I understand you saw my sister-in-law last night, Mr. Temple, Dinah Nelson. That's right. But... Uh, well, I suppose you're a very busy man, Mr. Temple, so I'd better come straight to the point. Yes, do. Well, you see, Dinah was very friendly with Richard Ferguson, the young man that was murdered. Yes, so she told me. Did she also tell you that the police asked a lot of questions about a postcard? A card that was supposed to have been sent to young Ferguson by a friend of his called Jonathan? She did mention it, yes. Well, now, a rather curious thing has happened, Mr. Temple. Uh -huh. Oh, whether it's of any importance or not, I wouldn't like to say, but... Well? Well, when I went down to breakfast this morning, the post had already arrived. And there was this postcard in the letterbox. Okay. You can see for yourself it's addressed to Dinah and was posted in Harrogate. Having a wonderful time regards Jonathan. But that's just what was on the other card. Exactly, Mrs. Temple. But your sister-in-law, Miss Nelson, said that you'd never heard of anyone called Jonathan. I know. But what did she say when you showed her this postcard? I haven't shown it to her. You haven't? No. Why not? Well, Dinah's a strange girl, Mr. Temple. She's highly strung, emotional... And I thought that if she saw this card, she'd think that the police suspect that she had something to do with this dreadful business. Do you think she did have anything to do with it? Oh, no, of course not. Dinah wouldn't harm a fly. Besides, she was in love with Richard Ferguson. You don't murder the person you're in love with. Well, it has been known, Mr. Mackintosh. Tell me, was Richard a friend of yours, too? No. I don't suppose I met him more than half a dozen times. My wife and I used to go up to Oxford occasionally to see Dinah, and, well, naturally we bumped into Richard. Did you like him? Yes, I did. He was a pleasant chap. Oh, he took himself a little too seriously, perhaps, but uh, I can't for the life of me imagine why anyone should want to murder him. How long is Dinah staying with you? Uh, two or three days. I believe she's due back on Monday. Do many people know that she's staying with you? Oh, well, I couldn't say. Uh, she always does stay with us, of course, when she comes to London. Mr. Mackintosh, on your visits to Oxford, did you ever meet a woman called Mrs. Russell? Yes, I did. She was a friend of Richard's. She used to encourage him a lot. Uh, with his writing, I mean. <laughs> yes, I don't think Dinah's very keen on Mrs. Russell. No, I rather gathered that. Well, thank you, Mr. McIntosh. Um, I'll take care of this card for the time being. I hope I did the right thing in bringing it to you. Mm -hmm, you did. Uh, well, goodbye, Mrs. Temple. I hope we'll meet again sometime. I hope so. I'll show you out. Oh, thanks. Goodbye, Mr. Temple. Goodbye. Who are you ringing for? I'm trying to get hold of a man called Red Harris. Do you remember him, Steve? We met him about six years ago. Um, tall man with a thin moustache. Mm, that's right. Why do you want to talk to him? Well, Sir Graham seems to think that he's mixed up in this business. I thought I might as well... Look, Steve, you take the phone. Uh -huh. Ask for Harris. He's more likely to come to the phone if it's a girl speaking. All right. What's the number? Hopton 5921. It's a public house near the Elephant and Castle. I've an idea he'll be there. Hopton 5921. That's right. I want to speak to Mr. Harris, please. What, Mr. Harris? You've got the wrong number, lady. Mr. Red Harris. Oh, Red. Who's he calling? His mother. <laughs> Are you Doris? The cute little number he's always talking about? What do you mean, cute little number? <laughs> OK, I'll get him. Hold on. Well, what's happening? He's coming. All right. Give it to me. I'll take it. Doris? Listen, I told you not to ring me, didn't I? Hello, Red. How are you? Well, who's that? Who's he speaking? It's Temple. Paul Temple, remember me? Samo said it was Doris on the <laughs> yes, phone. That's right, Red. There's nothing to worry about. It was my wife. Ah, I see. Well, what is it? What do you want? Oh, just a friendly chat. It's a long time since we met. It's about time we got together again, Red. Listen, I'm going straight now. I'm in the motor car rank. Business. Second-hand cars. Straight as a die, Mr. Temple. Oh, that's fine. I'm delighted to hear it. What is it you want? You spent two nights at Oxford this week, didn't you? Well, that's right. Why? What do you mean, why? There's nothing to stop me going up to Oxford if I feel like it, is there? 
Well, if you must know, I went up there on business. Picked up a car, a lumbar. She's a beauty. I only done 2,000 miles. You didn't meet a young man called Richard Ferguson by any chance? Well? Red, did you hear what I said? Yes, I heard. Now keep out of this Ferguson business. Don't be a damn fool, Temple. Keep out of it. Red, listen. Red! He's rung off. What did he say? Paul? What did he say? He said he was going straight. He said he was in the motor car business and... Steve, what time is it? It's just gone six. Tell Charlie to get the car. I'm going to see Red Harris. I'm going to talk to him. I'll be back about nine. You're rattled, Red. What's the matter with you tonight? You couldn't hit the side of a house. You're lucky, Simo. Dead lucky. <laughs> You've always been lucky at snooker. <laughs> That's a tenner you owe me. Now, nah, pick that cue up again and I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll play you 200 up a billion, see? Give you a 50 to start and the winner. Hey, looking for someone, mate? Yes, I'm looking for Mr. Red Harris. Oh, you haven't far to look. A pal of yours, Red? No. Hi, Maris. Oh. Who are you? What do you want? I understand you've got a car for sale at two and a half litre Lombard. Yeah, that, that's right. Is that it outside with trade plates? Yes, that's it. How many miles has it done? Two thousand, genuine. The owner only bought it to look at. Ah, oh, shut up, Simon. What are you asking for it? Seventeen fifty. Ah. Do you mind if I look at it? No, no, it's uh, a pleasure. Yeah, I'll see you later, Simon. Okay. What's the idea, Temple? I told you over the phone that Get I in don't... the car. We can't talk yet. We've nothing to talk about. Get in that car, Red. Okay. Now, what is it? What's on your mind? Six years ago, I did you a favour, Red. I know, and I haven't forgotten it. Do you remember what you said? You said, any time you want anything, Mr Temple, anything, just ask Red Harris. Yes, and I meant it. Honestly, I did. I'm a straight shooter, Mr Temple. I I'll say exactly what I think. Then tell me. Why did you spend two days in Oxford this week? I told you, I went there on business. I bought this car. You were in Oxford the night young Ferguson was murdered. I, I, I don't know anything about Ferguson. That's not what you told me on the phone. Well, what do you mean? You said, keep out of this Ferguson business, Temple. Did, did I say that? You did, Mr Harris. Temple, listen. I'm a friend of yours. You did me a good turn once and I haven't forgotten it. But I don't know anything about Ferguson. I went up to Oxford to buy this car. Listen, Red. Let's get this straight. I'm not here because the police sent me. Well, then why are you here? I'm here because the boy's parents asked me to investigate this case. I'm not interested in what sort of a racket you're running. I'm interested in two things. Who murdered Richard Ferguson and why? I don't know anything about Ferguson. I never heard of this kid until I read about the murder. You're lying. Now, listen, Red. I intend to get pretty tough over this business because I'm not going... Hello? What's this you've got in your pocket? How long have you been carrying a revolver? It isn't a revolver, it's my pipe. Eh? Ah, ah, no, let go of my arm. Temple, leave go, will you? What sort of a pipe is this? You stupid fool to get mixed up in this sort of thing. Now, give it to me, will you? Give it back now, to wait me. Wait a minute. Is this the gun that shot Ferguson? Oh, don't be a fool, Temple. Of course it isn't. You know darn well that murder isn't... Hey, what's that car? He's got a gun, get down! It's a good job I saw him. Otherwise he... Look, let's get back to the pub. I want a drink. Who was in that car? Who I... fired the shot? I, I, I don't know. But you recognised him. You knew he was going to shoot. I don't know who it was. I, I tell you, I don't know. I, I'm going back in the pub. I must have a drink, Temple. Red, wait a minute. You're mixed up in this Ferguson case. If you didn't murder Ferguson yourself, then you know who did. Temple, listen. You once did me a favour, OK? Now I'm doing you one. Keep out of this Ferguson business. But I'm in it already. And if you've got any sense, Reg, you'll talk. You'll talk to me now as a friend before it's too late. I'll tell you one thing, Temple, and then we're all square. I don't owe you a favour and you don't owe me one, OK? OK. They forgot the ring. Thank goodness.
goodness you've come. What's the matter, Steve? Mrs. Ferguson's here. She's in a dreadful state. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I think she's going out of her mind. But what's she doing here? She insists on seeing you. Mr. Ferguson had to bring her. The poor man just didn't know what... <clears throat> here he is. Oh, hello, Ferguson. What's the trouble? Temple, please believe me, I, I wouldn't have brought Helen here, but she absolutely insisted on seeing you. Where is she? She's in our bedroom, Paul. I've given her a sedative. Well, hadn't we better send her a doctor? She won't hear of a doctor. She simply won't hear of it. No, it's you she wants to see. This business seems to have unbalanced her. She's imagining all sorts of things, That's Temple. That's not true, Robert. Oh, Helen. Oh, hello, Mrs. Ferguson. Mr. Temple, I've got to talk to you. Well, here I am. Robert thinks I'm imagining things. But I'm not. I swear I'm not. I'm quite sure you're not, Mrs. Ferguson. But you don't know what she's saying, but Temple. But, Robert, it's true. I swear it is. Mr. Temple, I know you won't believe me. You'll think I've gone completely out of my mind. But do you know what happened this morning? Yes, Mrs. Ferguson. I know. You saw your son. That was the first episode of Paul Temple and the Jonathan Mystery by Francis Durbridge. The part of Paul Temple was played by Peter Cook and Steve by Marjorie Westbury. The play was produced for the BBC by Martin C. Webster. From London, we present the Francis Durbridge serial, Paul Temple and the Jonathan Mystery. <music> Episode 2, That Good Old Intuition. Mr. Temple, I've got to talk to you. Well, here I am. Robert thinks I'm imagining things, but I'm not. I swear I'm not. I'm quite sure you're not, Mrs. Ferguson. But you don't know what she's saying, but, Temple. But, Robert, it's true. I swear it's true. Mr. Temple, you'll think I've gone completely out of my mind, but... But do you know what happened this morning? Yes, Mrs. Ferguson, I know. You saw your son. Yeah. What? Oh, do you know what but you're saying? Do you know that... I knew it. I knew it was Richard. He... He is alive. Isn't he, Mr. Temple? Helen, please, darling, please. You see, you wouldn't believe me, Robert, but Mr. Temple believes me. He knows I'm telling the now, truth. Now, wait a minute, Mrs. Ferguson, wait a minute, please. Temple, what the devil does this mean? You've got to explain. Now, just wait a minute, please. Uh, now, are you all right, Mrs. Ferguson? Oh, yes, I'm all right, thanks. Well, we can't talk standing here. No. Let's go into the drawing room. Now, what's this all about, Temple? How did you know that my wife was under the impression that she had seen Richard? But I did see all him. All right, my dear. Now, let's hear what Mr. Temple's got to say. Ferguson, I don't think you quite understand the position. What do you mean? If your wife did see Richard, then I'm afraid you're facing a very difficult situation. How do you mean, Paul? Well, before I explain, Mrs. Ferguson, I want you to tell us what happened this morning. And please, just because your story sounds fantastic, don't imagine that we're not going to believe you. Well, go on, Helen. Well, I've been almost frantic ever since I heard the news about Richard. Of course. She spent most of last night crying, but this morning I finally persuaded her to go for a walk. And I went downstairs with Robert, and while he was getting his overcoat from the cloakroom, I went outside the hotel and stood in front of the main entrance. Was this the front entrance facing the strand? Yes. Go on. But Robert was rather a long time. I'd been some confusion over the cloakroom ticket, and I stood talking to the commissioner... I don't remember what we were talking about. Anyhow, while he was talking, I suddenly looked up. And there, a few yards away, standing on the opposite corner, watching me, was Richard. Helen. Oh, he was Richard. Well, I stood there, transfixed. After a moment, he, he put his hat on, turned round, and disappeared into the strand. I, well, I, I just didn't know what to do. And when Robert came, I told him what had happened, and of course, well, he, he didn't believe me, but but it was Richard. Ferguson, did you ask the commissioner whether he'd seen the young man? Oh, he saw a young man, all right, but Temple, how could it have been Richard? I saw Richard this morning. I identified the body. Did you actually identify the body? What do you mean? Now, listen. 
Before you even saw the body, you were convinced that your son had been murdered. He'd already been identified by three people and by a fingerprint test. Yes. Now, the point is this, and it's important, Ferguson. Quite apart from what you'd been told, did you personally see any definite marks of identification? No. No, I didn't. (laughs) Richard had no definite marks, no special peculiarities. Of course, it was impossible to identify the features because of the shot and... Well? Well, he was the same build as Richard. The same colouring. He was dressed in one of Richard's suits. And he was found in the flat. But you're not certain, are you, Ferguson? You're not 100% certain. I don't know. Temple, do you think there really is a chance that Richard's still alive? Yes, I do. You see, Robert? But why, Temple? I've just been talking to a man called Red Harris. He gave me certain information which made me suspect that your son had not been murdered. When I got home and Steve told me that Mrs. Ferguson was here and almost demented, I guessed what had happened. A temple, if Richard isn't dead, then who was murdered? Now, wait a minute. A few moments ago, I told you that you were facing a very difficult situation. Believe me, I didn't exaggerate. I think I know what that situation is. What do you mean, Mrs. Temple? Well, if Paul is right and Richard is alive, then obviously... Well, he... He's got to be found. Of course. We shall need your help, Ferguson. We shall need all the help we can get. But, Mr. Temple, don't you understand? We want to find Richard. Uh, Wait a minute, Helen. I think I see what you're getting at, Temple. You think that Richard committed the murder. Oh, no. Well, you think that he deliberately fostered the impression that he was the victim so that The moment I convince Scotland Yard that Richard Ferguson isn't dead... They'll get a warrant out for his arrest. Oh, but I don't believe that Richard committed the murder. I just don't believe Helen, it. Helen, please. How can we help you? I want you and Mrs. Ferguson to go back to the hotel. During the next few days, lead your normal life. Go shopping. If you've got any business appointments, keep them. You, you do think Richard will get in touch with us? Well, I think there's a chance, Mrs. Ferguson. A very good chance. And if he does? Phone me immediately. Or Inspector Gerard. But you... Excuse me, yes, sir. Yes, what is it, Charlie? Uh, Sir Graham Forbes is here, sir. I've put him in the study. Oh, thank you, Charlie. Did you ask Sir Graham to call? Yes, I phoned him about an hour ago. Steve, go and have a word with him. I'll be with you in two or three minutes. Yes, all right. Goodbye, Mrs. Ferguson. Goodbye. Try not to worry too much. Oh, thank you. I feel now that there really is a chance that everything can be fine again. I hope you're right, Helen. I certainly hope you're right. Well, I'm not convinced, Temple. Just because Mrs. Ferguson imagined she saw her son... Sir Graham, listen. Harry said they forgot the ring. Now, what do you think he meant by that? Well, There's he... only one possible explanation. The ring was not stolen because it was never on the body, for the simple reason that the body was not the body of Richard Ferguson. But, Temple, Sir you... Sir Graham, you mentioned the fingerprint test. What does the test consist of? We took the fingerprints of the dead man and compared them with those of Richard Ferguson. They were identical. Had you a record of Ferguson's prints? No, but... Well, then how were you able to compare them? We did what we always do in a case of this kind, Steve. We tested various objects in the flat. Ferguson's cigarette case, his razor, his wallet, his hairbrush and so on. His fingerprints were on every one of them. They were the fingerprints of the dead man. I don't question that, Sir Graham. I simply question whether the dead man was Richard Ferguson. Look here, Temple. What you're saying is this. Someone was murdered, taken to Richard Ferguson's flat and dressed in his clothes. The people responsible then proceeded to plant the fingerprints of the murdered man on Richard's personal effects. Knowing full well that you would test them in order to get a sample of his fingerprints. You haven't got Richard Ferguson's fingerprints, Sir Graham. You've only got the fingerprints of the dead man. No, I can't believe that, Temple. Now, look, if the murdered man isn't Richard Ferguson, then who is he and why was he murdered? Well, if it comes to that, why was Richard Ferguson murdered? Supposing you're right, Paul, and what you say actually did happen, then this person, the person that committed the murder, must be very thorough. But of course he's thorough. Then why did he forget the signet ring? Even if he hadn't Richard's ring, you'd have thought he'd have substituted one. Now, look, let's assume that before young Ferguson was shot, he put up a pretty good fight. And during the course of the fight, the signet ring came off. Mm -hmm. The people, or person, responsible for the murder, then tidied the room but forgot the signet ring. Surely that's what Red Harris meant. I don't agree. Anyhow, your people would have found it. When Harris said they forgot the ring, he said it with particular significance. 
In any case, Sir Graham, you can't ignore the fact that Mrs. Ferguson saw Richard. Oh, nonsense and hallucination. The woman's overwrought and highly strung. In my opinion, she saw a young man who looked like Richard and being in a nervous state... Yes, what is it, Charlie? I'm awfully sorry, Mrs. Temple, but a Mr. McIntosh is here and he insists on seeing Mr. Temple. I told him you was engaged, but he won't listen. Oh. Mr. Temple, I'm sorry, but I must speak to you. Oh, this is Sir Graham Forbes, Mr. McIntosh. Yes, we've met before. Mr. Temple, there's something I've got to tell you. It's important. Terribly important. Well? This afternoon, my sister-in-law, Dinah Nelson, had a telephone call from her boss, telling her to report back to Oxford first thing tomorrow morning. Well? Well, I've just taken Dinah to the station. I put her on the train and then went down into the underground. As I got onto the platform, there was a train leaving, and I noticed a young fellow standing by one of the doors. I only caught a glimpse of him, but I'll swear it was Richard Ferguson. Is this another hallucination, Sir Graham? Like some more coffee? Mm, yes, please, darling. Here you are. Thanks. Oh, I'm glad we didn't make a date tonight. Yes, yeah, so am I. Mm. It's nice to be home again. Oh. What happened this afternoon? Well, I saw Sir Graham and Inspector Gerard. We had a chat with our Scots friend, Reggie McIntosh. The inspector took a sample of his handwriting. What did he do that for? He wanted to compare it with the handwriting on the magazine. You know, the new feature, the mm -hmm. one that was sent to Ferguson. Was it the same? No. Mackintosh seemed pretty excited last night, didn't he? Bursting in like that. Well, wouldn't you be excited if you saw someone you thought was dead? Yes, yes. Anyhow, he convinced Sir Graham, which is more than we did. Mm. Paul, what do you think rarely happened? Do you think young Ferguson did commit the murder and then deliberately faked things? I don't know, Steve. I was talking to Gerard this afternoon about those postcards, the one that was meant for Richard and the one that Dinah Nelson got, or would have got, if it hadn't been for Mackintosh. Oh, you mean the ones from Jonathan? Yes, I had a hunch that the person who posted the cards also sent Ferguson the magazine. <laughs> but it wasn't a very good hunch, I'm afraid. The handwriting's quite different. Mm. Paul, mm -hmm. now, don't laugh. What do you mean, don't laugh? I've got a sort of intuition. Oh, by Timothy, not that good old intuition, no, Steve. No, no, really, darling, I'm serious. Well, come on, let's have it. Do you know what I think? No. I think Reggie McIntosh was lying last night. I don't think he did see Richard Ferguson. You mean you don't think that young Ferguson is alive? No, I think he's alive. Well, what then? Well, I think Mrs Ferguson saw him, but I don't think Reggie McIntosh did. Well, if he didn't see him, what on earth was the point of saying that he did? Oh, I don't know, darling. My intuition doesn't work that fast. <laughs> I'm not so sure that it works at all. Uh -uh. <laughs> Give me a cigarette. There is a box beside you. Oh, thanks. Do you know what I did this afternoon while you were at Scotland Yard? No. I read a book. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. I wouldn't say I enjoyed it. I found it interesting. It was called The Purple Moon. Well? By Mavis Russell. Oh, really? Mm, I thought you'd be interested. Paul, I think you ought to make a point of meeting Mrs Russell. Why? I am not so sure after reading her book that Dinah Nelson wasn't telling the truth. What do you mean? I think Mavis Russell might quite easily be the sort of person who could have an evil influence on an impressionable young man. <laughs> the book certainly seems to have impressed you, darling. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I agree about Mrs. Russell. It might be a very good idea if we went up to Oxford for two or three days. Yes. Oh, Lord, now who can this be? Hello? Hello? Is that you, Temple? Yes, who, who is that? This is Robert Ferguson. Oh, hello, good evening. Temple, I've got some news. I've got to be quick because I don't want Helen to overhear me. Well, what is it? I've heard from Richard. When? About half an hour ago, he, he telephoned me. Temple, please don't tell the police. Don't don't say anything, at least not yet. What's the matter? I think he's in trouble. He needs money. He asked me to meet him. When, tonight? Yes. Where? I can't tell you, not not over the phone. I, c can you pick me up in about 20 minutes? Uh, yes. Where are you now? I'm at the hotel. Meet me at the back entrance facing the embankment and, and bring your car, will you? Yes, all right. I'll explain when I see you, Temple. It's just uh, five to ten. 
I'll be there by quarter past. Okay, thanks. Who was it, Paul? It was Ferguson. He's heard from Richard. He has? Tell Charlie to get the car, darling. Why? What's happening? I'm afraid we've got a date after all, Steve. What a night. I can hardly see through the windscreen. Oh, there's Ferguson. Where? By the lamppost. Oh, yes. I don't think he's seen us. You better blow the horn. Hmm. What's the matter with the fellow? He's seen us. Hello. Oh, jumped in, Ferguson. Uh, uh, thanks. I'm sorry, Temple. I, I did see you, but I couldn't make it. What is it, hey, Mr. Ferguson? It's this old heart of mine. It lets me down every now and again. I was feeling perfectly all right standing in the doorway, and then suddenly... Would you like me to take you back to the hotel? No, no, it'll pass. I'll be all right in a minute. I've uh, got some brandy. Somewhere. No, I, I mustn't take that. I, I've got some tablets for this sort of thing, but they're in the hotel. But can I go and get no, them I'll for be you? all right, Mrs. Temple. Don't worry. Well, as long as you are all right. Uh, yeah, I thought this would happen. The moment I start worrying about anything, I always get this confounded heart trouble. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, what happened tonight, Ferguson? Well, as I told you, Richard telephoned. Fortunately, Helen was in the bath. I was expecting a business call from Birmingham. When I picked up the phone and heard Richard's voice, I just couldn't believe it. What did he say? He said, I'm in trouble, terrible trouble. Please don't ask any questions and listen to what I've got to say. And then he said that he needed money. He asked me to take it to an address in Lewisham. I, I wrote it down. Yeah, here it is. Oh, thank you. Did he say anything else? No, he wouldn't let me ask any questions. When I started to talk, he hung up on me. He sounded desperate. If you want my opinion, the boy's ill. That's why I didn't want you to contact the police. Not, not tonight. Is this the address? 439 Galveston Road, Lewisham? Yeah. Why have you written the name Griffiths? He told me to ask for Mr. Griffiths. I think he must be staying there under that name. Yes, most probably. Uh, does Mrs. Ferguson know about this? No, I told her it was the Birmingham call. Right now she thinks I'm in the bar drinking... <clears throat> Darn thing... See him, sir. Come back. Uh, Look, Ferguson, listen. You can't come out to Lewisham. Not I like know. this. If you see your son and start getting excited, you might have a very bad attack. The best thing you can do is go straight back to the hotel and go to bed. He's right, Mr. Ferguson. We'll see, Richard. We'll bring him back to the hotel tonight, I promise. You won't take him to the police first, will you? I've told you. I'll bring him back to the hotel. Okay, Temple. Thanks. Uh, g give me your arm. There you are. Open the door, Steve. Yes, sir. That's it. Uh, that's fine. I shan't be long, Steve. I'll be okay once I get to the elevator. so sure that it's on this side of the road. No, it must be. We passed 403 ages ago. Ah, here we are, 439. I don't see the number. It's on the gate. That might be anything. Anyhow, we'll try it. We'd better make a dash for it. Oh, what a night. Why on earth didn't we bring the umbrella? Be careful you don't slip. Phew. Oh, isn't it awful? Oh. I'm drenched. Oh. Oh, what a delightful looking establishment. Yeah. I should think young Ferguson's finding this a bit of a come down. Yes. Oh, let's try again. Do you think there's anyone in? Yes, I think so. There's a light showing. Ah, someone's coming now. Oh, good evening. Who is it? What do you want? We have an appointment with Mr. Griffiths. Oh? Are you expecting you? Yes, I've told you. We've an appointment. A bit late for appointments, isn't it? Nearly half past eleven. Mr Griffiths asked us to come. It's very important. Well, 
I don't know, I'm sure. I haven't seen you before, have I? You're not one of the regulars. Uh, look, Mrs... Um, Parsons is the name. Mrs Parsons, we can't stand out here. The rain's no. pouring off your roof. It's like standing under a waterfall. Well, you better come in. Oh, thank, thank you. you. you find Mr Griffith in his room. It's the door at the top of the stairs. Oh, thank you. Oh, wait a minute. I'll put the light on. Uh, is that the room up there? Oh, yes. Oh, perhaps you'd better wait down here. I'll pop up and tell him you've arrived. He's a bit on the fussy side of Mr Griffith. Thank you. Mr Griffith? Mr Griffith, your friends are here. Mr Griffith! Oh. Come on, come on, Steve, quickly. Oh. 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 He's dead. Dead. And there's blood all over the floor. Oh, my God, what's happened? What's happened? Stay here, Steve, with Mrs Parsons. I'm going into the bedroom. All right, dear. Oh. He's dead, isn't he? I saw him as soon as I opened the door. Oh, I can see the body. Is he dead? Yes. <laughs> Mrs. Parsons, that man in there, the man that's been murdered, is that Mr. Griffiths? Oh, yeah. yeah. Of course it is. You know it's Mr. Griffiths. Paul, what is it? It's not young Ferguson, Steve. It's Red Harris. Hello? Hello. Is that you, Temple? Oh. Hello, Sir Graham. You've only just caught us. We were halfway down the stairs. Where, where are you off to? Oxford? Uh, yes. How did you guess? Uh, the inspector told me. Ah. He said he thought you'd probably be going up there for two or three days. Yes, I want to meet Mrs. Russell and one or two of the university people. Oh, well, I'll phone Max Wyman and tell him to look you up. Max Wyman? Oh, uh, is he the young fellow who wrote a biography of Marcus Aurelius? Yes, that's right. Uh-huh. He's Lord Ellsworth's youngest son. He's a Balliol. He knows pretty well everybody in Oxford. If you want an introduction to anybody, he's your man. Oh, I'll be glad to meet him. Sir Graham, tell me, did the inspector see Ferguson? Oh, yes. The old boy's convinced, absolutely convinced, that it was Richard who spoke to him on the phone. Uh-huh. And what about Red Harris? Well, our people think the murder was committed at about half past nine. I see. How long had he been staying at the house? He checked in on Monday and paid a week's rent in advance. Oh, incidentally, he'd been using the name Griffiths for some time. He had a driving license in that name. I see. Hmm. All right, well, I'll contact you when I get back from Oxford, Sir Graham. All right, Temple. I'll phone Wyman this afternoon. Splendid, thanks. Goodbye. Goodbye, Temple. These shirts, Paul. Hmm? Oh, in the wardrobe. Oh, there isn't any more room in the wardrobe. I'd better put them in the chest of drawers. What do you mean there isn't any more room in the wardrobe? How many dresses have you brought down here? <laughs> By Timothy, Steve, you really are the limit. This is Oxford, not the south of France. You can't expect the wife of a successful novelist to go around looking like a tramp. Now, come off it, come off it. I've got wires to that one. <laughs> Hello? Mr. Temple? Yes? This is the hall porter speaking. There's a gentleman to see you, sir, a Mr. Wyman. Oh, send him up, please. Very good, sir. It's Sir Graham's friend, Max Wyman. Oh. Give me a hand with this dress, darling. All right. Well, keep your head down. Be careful, or, or you'll tear it. <sighs> but, but, I, I suppose you'd better invite Wyman to dinner. He'll probably be a very useful contact while we're down here. Yes. Zip me up the back, darling. Okay. I wonder if Wyman knows Mrs. Russell. 
Didn't Sir Graham say he was Lord Ellsworth's son? Yes. Then he knows Mrs. Russell. She'll have seen to that all right. <laughs> yes, I expect so. Oh, here he is. Ah. Now, come in, Mr. Wyman. Thank you. Sir Graham phoned me, Mr. Temple. He said you were staying down here for two or three days and he asked me to look you up. Hmm, oh, that's very nice of you. Um, this is my wife. Steve, this is Mr. Wyman. How do you do? You, do? you probably think it's odd my dropping in on you quite so soon, but Sir Graham said you were rather anxious to meet Mrs. Russell. Yes, as a matter of fact, I am. I understand she was a very close friend of young Ferguson's. <laughs> yes, I suppose she was. But Mavis is like that, you know. She doesn't just know people, she's always very close to them. <laughs> How long have you known Mrs. Russell? Oh, two or three years. At one time, we saw rather a lot of each other. She thought of writing a book on Justinian I. You know, the Roman Emperor. The fellow who bumped off that blighter focus. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm supposed to be rather bright on that particular period, so dear Mavis picked my brains for a month or two. She's a jolly good picker, too, when she gets going. <laughs> and uh, did she write the book? No, she didn't. She changed her mind and wrote an absolute shocker called The Purple Moon. <laughs> oh, Mr. Wyman, you're a man after my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, to get to the point. Mavis is giving a cocktail party tonight at seven o'clock. She's invited me and a girlfriend. Well? Well, I thought it might be a very good idea if Mrs. Temple turned out to be the girlfriend. Ah, yes, a very good <laughs> idea. And then later on, Mrs. Temple can introduce you to Mrs. Russell. It strikes me as a much better idea than just you sort of barging in on her. Mm, I agree. How about it, Steve? I'm game. Well, in that case, I think we ought to be making a move. It's nearly seven o'clock now. Yeah. Uh, what time will you be back? Oh, uh, half past eight at the latest. I'll drop Mrs. Temple at the hotel. No, don't do that. Uh, let's all have dinner together, say, quarter to nine. Thanks. By the way, I expect you know Dinah Nelson. Oh, very well. Now, she was a close friend of Richard's. Miss Nelson is under the impression that Mrs. Russell exercised a sort of evil influence over him. Hmm. Well, it all depends what you mean by an evil influence. Richard was very impressed by her, but he was rather an impressionable young man. Are you impressed by her? <laughs> Not in quite the same way. Oh. <laughs> Are you ready, Mrs. Temple? <laughs> yes, but you'd better make it Steve. Yes, I think I'd better, Mrs. Temple. Uh, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Tell the hall porter to send up the evening paper, darling, will you? Don't forget. Yes, all right, Paul. Excuse me, Mr. Wyman, I shan't be a moment. I'm just going to have a word with the hall porter. Right, I'll get the car. See you outside. Yes. Would you send an evening paper up to room 175, please? And tomorrow morning... Mrs. I... Temple? Yes? Uh, you're wanted on the telephone, madam. Uh, will you take it over here, please? Yes, of course. Here you are, madam. Thank you. Oh, hello, Mr. Wyman. Didn't you get the car? No, I thought I'd wait for you. Will you excuse me a moment? I'm wanted on the telephone. Yes, of course. Hello? Steve, where are you speaking from? I'm in the hall. In a box? No. Are you alone? No. Is Wyman with you? Yes. Can he overhear what I'm saying? Oh, I don't think so. Listen, Steve. That man's an imposter. He isn't Max Wyman. That was the second episode of Paul Temple and the Jonathan Mystery by Francis Durbridge. The part of Paul Temple was played by Peter Cook and Steve by Marjorie Westbury. The play was produced for the BBC by Martin C. Webster. From London, we present the Francis Durbridge serial Paul Temple and the Jonathan Mystery. Episode 3, The Ring. Steve, listen. That man's an imposter. He isn't Max Wyman. Oh? Really? What an extraordinary thing. You you heard what I said? Yes. Is he still standing near you? Hmm, fairly. Now listen. Go outside, walk up to the car with him, and then suddenly pretend that you've left your handbag in the bedroom and come back to the hotel. I'll see you in the hall. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes, all right. Oh, and get the number of the car. Yes, do that. Look forward to seeing you. Goodbye. Ready now? Yes, quite ready, Mr. Wyman. Oh, you've left your handbag. Oh, uh, thank you. Is that your husband on the phone? No, it was an old girlfriend of mine. Didn't sound like a girlfriend. <laughs> and it's the sort of girlfriend I'd rather you didn't mention to my husband. Oh, oh I see. I hope you do see him, Mr. Wyman. Where's your car? It's just round the corner. This is rather a dashing car. What is it? It's a new Phoenix. Is it jet propelled? <laughs> it's not as fast as it looks. Jump in. Well, if I'm going to ride in this chariot, I'll need a scarf. Oh, nonsense. You don't need a scarf. Oh, I certainly do. I shan't be a minute, Mr. Wyman. I bet you won't blast you. All right, Steve. Yes. Where is he? In the car? Yes, but I think he suspects something. I left my handbag on the desk and he spotted it. Where is the car? Just around the corner. Come on, then. Yes, you were right, Steve. There he goes. He looked suspicious when I put the phone down. Did you get the car number? Yes, it's 639GXO. 639GXO. Well, thank goodness you're all right anyway. But how on earth did you know he wasn't Wyman? Well, the penny had dropped just as you walked out. I suddenly remembered what he said about Mrs. Russell. What do you mean? Well, you remember, he said she thought of writing a book on Justinian I, the Roman emperor who murdered Focus. Well? Well, the real Max Wyman would never have made a mistake like that. Focus was murdered by a character called Heracles. Oh, get you. <laughs> Fancy remembering that. <laughs> yes, but I only just remembered it in time. Come on, let's go back to the hotel. Will you get me a call to London, please? Oh, certainly, sir. Putney, 9301. A personal call to Sir Graham Forbes. Very good, sir. Oh, by the way, that gentleman, Mr. Wyman, have you ever seen him before? No, madam. Oh, Mr. Temple, uh, here's your evening paper. Oh, thank you. By Timothy. What is it? Well, look at the front page. The Fleet Street boys have certainly gone to town. Is Richard Ferguson alive, mystery of university undergraduate Paul Temple in Oxford? Someone must have talked. It's either one of the Fergusons or Reggie McIntosh. Yes. Come on, let's go up to our room. Paul, what do you think would have happened if you hadn't spotted that slip of Wyman's or whatever his name was? I wonder... You know, Steve, it's my bet that whoever's behind all this must think that I'm on to something. And try to abduct me in order to divert your attention. Exactly. I suppose all I talk about a cocktail party at Mrs. Russell's was nonsense. Yes, of course. Well, that'll be your call to Sir Graham. Oh, yeah. Hello? Your call to London, sir. Oh. Hold on a moment, please. Hello? Hello, Sir Graham. Tempo here. Oh, hello. Sir Graham, tell me, did you get in touch with Max Wyman? I phoned his dick soon after you left. Unfortunately, Wyman's away. He's not due back in Oxford until tomorrow night. Who did you speak to? What do you mean? Well, who did you speak to when you phoned? I spoke to a young fellow called Rudolph Charles. Ah. He said he was a roommate of Wyman's. Did you leave a message? Yes, I told him to tell Wyman that you were staying at the Star Hotel. Why, is anything wrong? Yes, someone impersonated Wyman and tried to abduct Steve. What? We got the car number, 639-GXO. I'll get the Oxford people onto that straight away. Sir Graham, what did this fellow Charles sound like? He was a foreigner, rather an attractive accent. We seemed a pleasant sort of fellow over the phone. Temple, you don't think that he impersonated Wyman? No, no, it, it doesn't sound like it. All right, thank you, Sir Graham. I'll keep in touch. Goodbye. Goodbye, Temple. Sir Graham telephoned Wyman, but he was away. Sir Graham left a message with a man called Rudolph Charles. Do you think it was Charles who impersonated Wyman? Mm, I doubt it. You know, Paul, this is a very curious case, isn't it? Mm, what do you mean? Well, take Red Harris. He was mixed up in this case. He must have been, otherwise he wouldn't have been murdered. But Red Harris was hardly the sort of man to associate with young Ferguson. Mm, it rather depends what young Ferguson was up to. And then take this man tonight who impersonated Wyman. He was a very different type from Red Harris. Oh, well, give me the Red Harris type every time. Yes, yes, I know, darling, but what I'm getting at is this. 
It seems to me that we're up against something a little different this time. We're up against something... Oh, all right. I'll go. Mr. Temple? Yes? Uh, my name is Rudolf Charles. I'm a friend of Max Wyman's. I spoke to Sir Graham Forbes on the ah, telephone. Ah, yes, yes. Come in, Mr. Charles. I'm delighted to meet you. Thank you. I hope I'm not intruding. No, no, not at all. As a matter of fact, I intended to call you later this evening. Uh, may I introduce my wife? This is Rudolf Charles, Steve, the oh, young man Sir Graham mentioned. He's a friend of Max Wyman's, the real Max Wyman. What do you mean, Mr. Temple, uh, the real Max Wyman? Well, a short while ago, a young man called on us and introduced himself as Max Wyman. But Max is in Scotland. He's, he's not due back until tomorrow night. I, I told Sir Graham that over the telephone. Yes, I know you did. Well, why should anyone want to impersonate Max? Mr. Charles, did you tell anyone that you'd spoken to Sir Graham? No. You didn't mention to any of your friends that I was staying here and that Sir Graham wanted Max Wyman to look me up? No, why should I? Oh, Mr. Temple, it's common knowledge that you're staying here. In Oxford, I mean. Haven't you seen the evening papers? Yes, but it isn't common knowledge that Sir Graham tried to telephone Wyman. Oh, oh I see your point. Uh, I'm the only person who knew about the telephone call. Exactly. Well, I can assure you I didn't mention it to anyone. It didn't seem very important. Mr. Temple, I'll tell you why I called on you this evening. In one of the London papers, there's a report that a man called um, Mackin... Reggie McIntosh. Uh, that's right. It, there's a report that he saw Richard Ferguson in London two days ago. He swears it was Ferguson he saw. Well? Well, is there any truth in it? Supposing I said there was some truth in it. Ah, then that, that would explain a great deal. What do you mean? The morning after Richard Ferguson was murdered, or, or shall we say the morning after the body was discovered, a friend of mine thought she saw Richard go into the encounter. She actually followed him into the restaurant. When she got inside, however, the place was empty. Well, naturally, Elliot laughed at her. He thought it was a hallucination. Elliot? Yes, Mark Elliot. He, he owns the encounter. Was Mr. Elliot a friend of Richard's? Yeah, in, in a casual way. I see. Mr. Temple, do you think my friend really did see Richard? How well did you know Richard Ferguson? Oh, not very well. We, we met at debating societies, that sort of thing. He was not a personal friend of mine. Was he a personal friend of this girl's? No, I don't think she'd met him more than two or three times. Oh, then she was probably mistaken. It was most likely someone else she saw. We're just going down to have a drink. Will you join us? Oh, I should like to, but I, I have a date at half past seven... Uh, some other time, perhaps? Yes, of course. Goodbye, Mrs. Temple. Good night, Mr. Charles. I'll get Max to give you a ring the moment he returns from Scotland. Thank you. Oh, by the way, did you ever meet a friend of young Ferguson's called Jonathan? Jonathan? Yes. No, I'm afraid not. Why? Oh, I wondered, that's all. Good night, Mr. Charles. Good night. Well, I don't care for that young man. You don't? Why not? He's far too attractive. <laughs> And that accent. I will get Max to ring you the moment he returns <laughs> from Scotland. Oh, come on. Let's go down and have a drink. <laughs> oh, Paul, why do you think Reggie McIntosh gave that story to the press? About seeing Richard, I mean. Sir Graham told him to keep it quiet. He made quite a point of it. Yes, he did, didn't he, Steve? Come on, darling. Drinks. I'll see you in the lounge, Steve. I'm going to get some cigarettes. Oh, all right, dear. Have you any cigarettes? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I haven't got any here at the moment. Oh, it's all right. I'll get some at the bar. Oh, very good, sir. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Russell. Good evening, George. How are you these days? Oh, I'm very well, thank you. Can't grumble at all. Well, it's a long time since we saw you, madam. Yes. George, tell me, have you got a Mr. Temple staying in the hotel? You mean Mr. Paul Temple? Yes. <laughs> well, why, this is Mr. Temple, madam. Oh, oh I, I beg your pardon. Mrs. Russell? Yes. What can I do for you? Well, I, I don't know whether you've heard of me or not, Mr. Temple, but I was a friend of Richard Ferguson's. Yes, of course I've heard of you, Mrs. Russell. As a matter of fact, my wife's just finished reading a book of yours, The Purple Moon. Oh, that. <laughs> Curiously enough, Mr. Temple, I've just finished a book of yours, The Dorking Murder. Oh, that. <laughs> <laughs> the papers say you're investigating the Ferguson case. Is that true? I'm certainly very interested in the case. Well, perhaps you don't know, but I'm considered a suspect in the Ferguson case. Really? Oh, yes. I'm the notorious Mrs. Russell, who influenced an impressionable young undergraduate. You sound as if you've been talking to Dinah Nelson. 
Oh, she isn't the only one who thinks that way. No. Half Oxford is convinced that if I didn't actually murder Richard, I most certainly had something to do with it. Oh. Have you seen tonight's paper, Mrs. Russell? Of course I have. That's why I'm here. I wouldn't have known that you were in Oxford if I hadn't read... Oh, you mean that absurd story. Of course Richard's dead. I hope to identify his body. I think this man Mackintosh must be out of his mind. I'm surprised at the press falling for such nonsense. Supposing I told you that at least two other people had seen Richard? Then I should say that Mr. Mackintosh wasn't the only person who needed his head examined. <laughs> well, let's join my wife, Mrs. Russell. She's in the lounge. But you don't really believe this story, do you? You don't think that Richard Ferguson is alive? Yes, I do. But it's nonsense, absolute nonsense. In any case, I know he's dead. How do you know? I had a letter this afternoon from the man who murdered him. Do sit down, Mrs. Russell. Thank you. Paul, you have the other chair. I'll sit on the bed. Good. I'm sorry dragging you up to our bedroom, but we can at least talk more freely here. Oh, yes, of course. Well, now, Mrs. Russell... About that letter. Before I show you the letter, I want to talk to you about Richard. I want to make quite certain that you understand my side of the story. I'll do my best. Well, I wasn't in love with Richard Ferguson, and I never made love to him either. He had talent, but like most young writers, he needed encouragement. I read pretty well everything Richard wrote. I criticised his work, I lent him books, introduced him to influential people... If that's considered to be exercising an evil influence, then I certainly exercise it over Richard Ferguson. Hmm. Go on, Mrs. Russell. When Richard was murdered, certain people suggested I was responsible. Oh, but surely... Oh, they didn't actually accuse me of committing the murder, but they insinuated that I'd introduced him to the wrong people. Insinuations are of very little importance. It's what the police think that really matters. Yes, but that's just the point. I believe the police think that I really did have something to do with the murder. Show me the letter you received. It's simply a typewritten note, unsigned. It arrived by the first post this morning. Oh, may I see it? Read it out, Paul. Uh, dear Mrs. Russell, I feel quite sure that you, more than anyone else, would like to have the enclosed. It belonged to Richard Ferguson. What makes you think this note was sent by the person who murdered Ferguson? Because this is what he sent me. The signatory? Oh. Yes. If the person who wrote that note didn't murder Richard, then how did they get hold of the ring? Is it Ferguson's ring? Yes. You're sure? Quite sure. So you believe that young Ferguson was murdered, and the murderer stole the signet ring, and then, for some reason which isn't at all clear, sent it to you? Yes. Where was the letter posted, Paul? Um, London, SW7, last night. Did you ever meet a friend of Richard Ferguson's called Jonathan... Jonathan who? I don't know. The reason I ask is because a postcard arrived after the murder. It was signed, Jonathan. So far, the police have been unable to locate the sender. Is it important? Everything's important when you're investigating a murder. Have you looked at this ring very closely? Why? Have you noticed what's on the inside? No. There are some letters and numbers. You can see them quite clearly. Look. A4, D4. Oh, that's funny. I never noticed that before. You've no idea what it means? Not the slightest. I'm afraid I shall have to keep it and the note for the time being. Yes, of course. Mrs. Russell, you said you introduced Richard to quite a lot of influential people. Did you introduce him to a man called Mark Elliott? Yes, I did. He runs a restaurant, doesn't he? He owns a restaurant, The Encounter. If you're staying in Oxford for any length of time, you'd be well advised to try it. <clears throat> How old is Mr. Elliott? Oh, Middle 40s. Is he married? No, he's a bachelor and a teetotaler. Does he live in Oxford? Yes, he has a very beautiful flat above the restaurant. Was he a great friend of Richard Ferguson's? No. I don't think Mark liked Richard very much. You know, Richard was a very peculiar boy. I was very fond of him, but, well, he could be very difficult at times. How do you mean, difficult? Well, sometimes he talked too loudly and too often about things he knew very little about... I understood him. I knew it was all part of a boyish enthusiasm. But I'm afraid Mark wasn't quite so tolerant. Mm, I can understand that. Mrs. Russell, don't you sometimes write for a magazine called The New Feature? Yes. I write a weekly article for them under the name of Europa. 
Why? Someone sent Mr and Mrs Ferguson a copy of that magazine. The name Europa was underlined. The person who underlined it also scribbled the words, If you want to know who murdered your son, ask Europa. What a beastly thing to do. Mm, I'm inclined to agree. Have you any idea who did it? No. No, I haven't. It might have been any one of my dear friends. Mr Temple, tell me quite frankly, do you think I murdered Richard Ferguson? No, I don't. For the simple reason that I don't think he was murdered. But I'd still like to know who sent the Fergusons that magazine. Mrs. Russell was right about this restaurant, Paul. It certainly is attractive. Yes. I think perhaps they could have done with just one chandelier less. Mm, perhaps <laughs> one. Good evening, sir. Oh, good evening. Have you reserved a table, sir? Uh, no, I'm afraid we haven't. I shall have to keep you waiting about a quarter of an hour, sir. I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right. Where is the ladies' cloakroom? On the first floor, madam. Thank you. I'll see you later, darling. Yes, all right, Steve. You seem very busy tonight. We're like this most nights, sir. On Saturdays, it's quite impossible to get a table unless you reserve well in advance. How long have you been open? Just about a year, sir. Well, it's obviously a great success. Yes, it is, sir. Can I get you anything to drink? Uh, no, thanks. I think I'll wait for my wife. Very good, sir. Why, hello, Mr. Temple. Oh, hello, Miss Nelson. Was that Mrs. Temple just going upstairs? Yes. Do you know, I thought it was. I said to Reggie that... Oh, I'm sorry. This is my brother-in-law, Reggie McIntosh. Yes, we've met before, haven't we, Mr. McIntosh? Yes, we have. The last time we met, you promised... I know, I know exactly what you're going to say. Mr. Temple's annoyed with me, Dinah, and for a very good reason, too, I'm afraid. Oh, what do you mean, Reggie? Well, go on, you'd better tell her, Mr. Temple. Sir Graham Forbes of Scotland Yard told your brother-in-law that under no circumstances must he tell the press that he'd seen Richard Ferguson. Well, I did tell them. Yes. I'm sorry, but the fact is I had a few drinks with a pal of mine, one of the Fleet Street boys. He started to talk about the Ferguson case and... Well, I simply had to tell him that I'd seen Richard. But, Mr. Temple, what does it matter what the newspapers say? The fact remains that Richard's alive, and I'm sure there's a perfectly simple explanation to the whole mystery. I hope you're right. But don't forget, if the murdered man wasn't Richard Ferguson, he was certainly somebody, and someone murdered him. You're not suggesting that Richard did? Well, that's the only simple explanation I can think of. What? You mean Richard invited this man to his flat? Shot him in the head so that he couldn't be recognised, dressed him up in his own clothes... That's absurd! Why? Someone committed the murder. Yes. Well, I'm quite sure that Richard didn't. How long are you staying in Oxford, Mr McIntosh? Oh, a day or so. I usually pop up to Oxford two or three times a week. I'm in the textile business. I think we ought to be making a move, Reggie. I don't want to be late. Yes, all right, Dinah. Oh, Miss Nelson? Yes? Have you seen this before? Where did you get that ring from? You haven't answered my question. Where did you get that ring from? Is it Richard Ferguson's? Yes. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. Please, let me have it. Now, Dinah, Dinah, my dear. Why do you want the ring, Miss Nelson? Because I haven't got anything of Richard's. I haven't got anything to remember him by. Now you're talking as if Richard was dead. Only a moment ago, you seemed quite convinced that he wasn't. Oh, Mr Temple, please, please let me have that ring. I'm sorry, Miss Nelson. What are you going to do with it? Hand it over to the police. But, Mr. Temple, don't you realise... Now, realize don't be that... stupid. If Mr. Temple considers that the ring is important, it's his duty to hand it over to the police. After all, Dinah, don't forget, Mr. Temple's a private investigator. So far as the police are concerned, he's in the same position as you or I. I'm sorry, Mr. Temple. I didn't mean to be stupid. Now, come along, Dinah. Good evening, Dinah. Good evening, McIntosh. Oh, good evening, sir. You're just leaving? Yes. We've had an excellent dinner and I'm just taking Dinah home. You look rather tired, Dinah. Yes. I've had rather a busy time just lately. Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, may I introduce Mr. Temple? Uh, Paul Temple, Mark Elliott. Oh. How do you do, Mr. Temple? Oh, this is a pleasant surprise. I heard that you were in Oxford. Yes, most people seem to have heard. Good night, Mr. Temple. Good night. Good night, Mark. Good night, Dinah. Uh, if you should want to get in touch with me, Mr. Temple, I'm staying at the Cromwell. I'll be there until Friday. I'll remember that. Good night. Good night. <sighs> Are you alone? Uh, no, I'm waiting for my wife. Well, may I offer you a drink while you're waiting? Oh, well, thank you. Well, let's go into the cocktail bar.
Good evening, Mr. Elliot. Uh, good evening, Bobby. What would you like, Temple? Uh, may I have a dry martini? Yes, of course. Dry martini, Bobby, and the usual for me. Uh, yes, sir. I suppose you've seen the story in the papers about Richard Ferguson. Yes. Is it true? Yes, I think it is. In other words, young Ferguson's alive? Yes. Well, I'm delighted to hear it. Why? Was Ferguson a friend of yours? Uh, no, to be candid, I couldn't tolerate the fellow. I prefer my intellectuals to be over 40. <laughs> no, the reason I'm delighted to hear that he's alive is simply because... Well... I find this rather difficult to put into words. You can speak quite freely to me. Yes, I'm sure I can. It isn't that, but... Well, look, Temple. The morning I heard that Richard Ferguson was murdered, I was terrified, absolutely terrified. You see, I had a motive for murdering young Ferguson, a very strong motive. What was your motive? Richard Ferguson was blackmailing me. I'm tired. <laughs> did you like that restaurant? Yes, I did, darling. It's a little flamboyant, perhaps, but I liked it. Mm. And what about Mark Elliot? I don't know quite what to make of him. He's a peculiar mixture, isn't he? Mm, he certainly is. Do you know what he told me, Steve, before you joined us? No. He told me that Richard Ferguson had been blackmailing him. What? He told me in confidence that during the past six weeks, young Ferguson had had about £2,000 out of him. <laughs> Did he tell you what young Ferguson was blackmailing him about? No, he didn't. But Richard must have had plenty of money. His father's very well off. No, that doesn't mean to say that Richard was. Steve, what did you think of Mrs. Russell? Well, much to my surprise, I took rather a favourable view of her. <laughs> yes. Mavis Russell is a very smart woman. And what do you mean by that? She can adapt herself to the company she's with. Oh... I say, by Timothy, you are tired, aren't you? I'm exhausted. What time is it? Uh, quarter to twelve. Oh, I thought it was much later than that. Oh, who do you think that is? Uh, it might be Sir Graham. Oh, it's rather late for Sir Graham, surely. Hello? There's a call for you, sir. Uh, hold on a moment, please. Right. Who is it? I don't know yet. You're through. Hello? Paul Temple. Yes. This is Richard Ferguson speaking. What? Mr. Temple, please listen. This is urgent. I haven't a lot of time. All right, go on. I understand you've got the signet ring, the one that Mavis Russell gave you. Yes. Well, I want you to take it to Mrs. Gulliver first thing tomorrow morning. Mrs. Gulliver? Yes, she's my landlady. Mrs. Gulliver, 3 Mortimer Close. Have you got the address? Yes, 3 Mortimer Close. Now listen, Temple. If you do what I tell you and take that ring to her, I give you my word of honour that I'll meet you tomorrow night anywhere, any time, and tell you exactly what this is all about. How will you know whether Mrs. Gulliver's got the ring or not? Oh, don't worry. I'll know. All right, I'll do what you say. Good. Now, where do you want me to meet you? Uh, you suggest the place, I'll be there. Well, do you know the encounter, the restaurant? Yes, but surely... If Mrs. Gulliver gets the ring, I'll see you there tomorrow night at ten o'clock. OK? I can depend on that. You can depend on it, Temple. Good, I'll be there. Right. Who was it? It was young Ferguson. What? Steve, where did I put that ring? You put it in your pocket. At least you said you did. Yes, I put it in my inside pocket, the ticket pocket. I'm sure I did. Absolutely positive I did. Steve, it's gone. Oh, darling, it can't. Now, just think, when did, when did you see it last? When I showed it to Dinah Nelson. It was while you were in the cloakroom. Then I put it back in my inside pocket and deliberately... What is it? I was just thinking. Reggie McIntosh stood very close to me while Dinah Nelson was saying goodnight to Elliot. I don't think it was Reggie McIntosh, Paul. Why do you say that? I think Elliot took it. I think he took it just as I walked into the cocktail bar. What makes you think that? Well, don't you remember? You both stood up. You were standing very close together. And Elliot took you by the arm and moved the table slightly so that I could get yes, by. Yes, you're right, Steve. Uh, uh, come in. Mrs. Ferguson. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Temple. Oh, come in, Mrs. Ferguson. I I am so sorry to disturb you. We, we did call around earlier this evening. We've only been back five or ten minutes. Are you staying here, Mrs. Ferguson? Yes, we're just along the corridor. We arrived about eight o'clock. We came down 
To see Mrs. Gulliver, that's um, Richard's landlady, Mr. Temple. Yes, I know. Well, she telephoned us this morning. The poor dear seems rather worried. What about exactly? Well, apparently a letter arrived for Richard this morning, and Mrs. Gulliver opened it by mistake. What sort of letter? Well, that's just the point. The letter doesn't seem important. It doesn't seem at all important. And yet... Well? It's from that friend of Richard's. The one no one seems to know anything about. Jonathan. That was the third episode of Paul Temple and the Jonathan Mystery by Francis Durbridge. The part of Paul Temple was played by Peter Cook and Steve by Marjorie Westbury. The play was produced for the BBC by Martin C. Webster. Episode 4, The Encounter. We arrived about 8 o'clock, Mrs. Temple... We came down to see Mrs. Gulliver, that's Richard's landlady. Yes, I know. Go on, Mrs. Ferguson. Well, she telephoned us this morning. The poor dear seems rather worried. What about exactly? Well, apparently a letter arrived for Richard this morning, and Mrs. Gulliver opened it by mistake. What sort of a letter? Well, that's just the point. It, it doesn't seem important. It doesn't seem at all important. And yet... She, well? Well, it's from that friend of Richard's, the one no one seems to know anything about. Jonathan. Jonathan? Yes, uh, may I see it? Yes. Um, oh, I expect that's Robert. Come in, Mr. Ferguson. Thank you, Mrs. Temple. I had a hunch you'd be here, Helen. I wanted Mr. Temple to see the letter, Robert. Mrs. Gulliver seemed to think it was important. How can it be important? It's just a letter wishing a guy a happy birthday. What does it say? Uh, dear Richard, this is just to wish you a happy birthday. Hope to see you at the end of the week. Regards, Jonathan. Well, does that strike you as being a very mysterious letter? You say Mrs. Gulliver opened it by mistake? That's right. She was in quite a flap about it. When did you see her? This evening. Helen suddenly got it into her head that Richard might try and contact Mrs. Gulliver. She's made the old girl promise that if he does, she'll get in touch with us straight away. I see. Look, it seems to me there's a perfectly simple explanation for all this Jonathan business. Oh, what is the simple explanation? Jonathan is a friend of Richard's. He's on holiday, and he hasn't taken the trouble to read the newspapers. I know I don't on holiday. So he simply doesn't know anything about the murder or Richard's disappearance. Ferguson, tell me, was that the only reason you came to Oxford to see Mrs. Gulliver? No, no not entirely. My wife thinks he's being blackmailed. Mm, blackmailed? Yes, yeah, she's convinced that he didn't commit the murder himself and that someone is exercising a sort of influence over him. Is that your opinion? No, it is oh, not. Robert. It's no good, Helen. I've got to speak my mind. Look, Temple, Richard's an only child. I, I don't want to get sentimental, but he's the only thing we've got in the world. But just because we're crazy about him, it doesn't mean to say that we can't see straight. It doesn't mean to say that I can't see straight anyway. Richard's always been a peculiar boy. He's selfish and egotistic. Well, Robert, Listen, yes. Helen, if Mr. Temple's going to help us, he's got to know the truth. Did you make Richard an alliance? Uh, sure. How do you think he lived? Was it a generous one? <laughs> Depends what you call generous. Well, six thousand uh, dollars a year. Oh, that certainly is generous. Supposing he suddenly found that he needed money, quite a lot of money, two thousand pounds, for instance, would he have asked you for it? Well, who else? Would you have given it to him? Uh, that depends. Two thousand pounds is a lot of well, money. If Richard needed the money, he'd have got it, Mister Temple. If not from his father, then from me. But he didn't need money. He'd no financial troubles. Are you sure? I'm positive. Mister hmm. uh, Temple, you remember that magazine, the one that was sent to our hotel with the the message scrawled across it? Yes. Well, we've discovered who Europa is. It's the nom de plume of a writer called Mavis Russell. Apparently, she lives in Oxford. 
and it was a friend of Richard's. I expect Mr. Temple already knows that. Yes, I do. I've met Mrs. Russell. Uh, was she a great friend of Richard's? Uh, yes, I think she was. She still believes that it was Richard who was murdered. Oh, but that's absurd. I've seen Richard. Richard's alive, all right. There's no doubt about it. I only hope he stays that way. What do you mean, Robert? I don't know whether Mr. Temple agrees with me or not, but I've got a hunch that it isn't only the police that Richard's trying to avoid. But who else would he want to avoid? I don't know. Maybe a woman, maybe Mrs. Russell. Or, who knows, maybe Jonathan. You're late. And you're making a beast of yourself. Mm, well, this porridge is very good. Look, there's an excellent menu this morning. Kippers, ham and eggs, kedgeree. Maybe, but just coffee for me. <laughs> you know, you look like the morning after the night before. Oh, thank you very much. It's taken me 20 minutes to look like this. <laughs> I didn't mean that. I meant only. <laughs> you get on with your breakfast. <laughs> oh, why three cups? We've got company, darling. Oh, Lord. If there's anything I detest, it's company for breakfast. Do you see it? <gasps> Oh, sorry. <laughs> Great. Oh, I didn't mean you. When did you arrive in Oxford? Oh, about an hour ago. Will you have some coffee? Thank you. Temple, I've just been on the phone to the inspector. He confirms what I've told him. What was that? Well, you remember the card, the first Jonathan card, that arrived for Richard the morning after the murder? Yes. Well, the Yard have discovered that the actual message on the card, the one supposed to be from Jonathan, was a blind. Our cryptographical people got to work on it, Steve. They x-rayed it and discovered a secret message. What, an invisible ink? Yes, this was obviously the real message, the one intended for Richard Ferguson. And was it from Jonathan? It was signed, Jonathan, but, well, I suppose message is hardly the right word. It's just a list of letters and numbers, probably a cipher of some sort. Show Steve the copy I gave you, Temple. Oh, here you are, Steve. I don't suppose you make head or tail of it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> We also examined the second card, the one that was intended for Dinah Nelson. The one that Reggie McIntosh gave me? Yes, it was negative, completely negative. It didn't reveal anything except the actual handwriting. Perhaps you'd better do the same to this letter. Dear Richard, this is just to wish... Where did you get this letter? Mrs Ferguson gave it to us last night. Apparently it arrived for Richard yesterday morning and his landlady, Mrs Gulliver, opened it by mistake. Oh, I think I'd better tell you what happened last night, Sir Graham. Yes, do. Well, when we arrived Just here... a moment, darling. Um, this cipher, Sir Graham. Yes? Uh, look. 789267246 A-L-E-F-L-O-E-L-F. Well? Well, if you split the numbers up and say, take the first three numbers and the first three letters, 789-A-L-E... Yes, now take the next three numbers and the next three letters. 267-FLO. What are you getting at, Steve? Well, they look like car registration numbers. 246-ELF. Why, Timothy, she's right, Sir Graham. 246-ELF. Hmm? I remember that number. Do you? It's the number of the car that Red Harris showed me, the Lombard, the one that was for sale. Are you sure? Absolutely positive. Ah, that good old intuition. Ah. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> I wonder if the others tie up in any way. I'll phone the numbers to Inspector Gerard and get a check on them. <laughs> Jolly good, Steve. Mm. <laughs> That'll cost you a new hat, darling. Oh, yeah? And I've seen the very model, LSD-1414. What? Fourteen guineas to you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if this Jonathan business has got anything to do with a car racket, it's a curious coincidence. What do you mean? The French people picked up André Dumas last night. Dumas? Yes, he's probably the biggest car racketeer on the continent. Oh, yes, I remember reading about him. They've been after him for months. Mm -hmm. Now, tell me what happened last night, Temple. Well, just after I phoned you, we ran into Mrs Russell. She gave me a signet ring, which she said was Richard's, and which she said had been sent to her through the post. Steve and I then went along to the Encounter. That's a restaurant owned by a man called Mark Elliott. Yes, I've heard of it. And at the Encounter, either Mark Elliott or Reggie McIntosh or Dinah Nelson relieved me of the ring. When we got back to the hotel, Richard Ferguson phoned me. Richard Ferguson? Mm-hmm. And told me to take the ring to Mrs Gulliver. 
He said that if I did, he would meet me tonight at the encounter and explain what this is all about. After I'd spoken to Richard, his mother turned up with the letter, the one I'd given to him. Did you tell her about the phone call? No, I didn't mention the call or the ring. Hmm. It's a pity you lost that ring, Temple. Yes, I agree. But I still intend to see Mrs. Gulliver. If young Ferguson's in touch with her, then it's ten to one Excuse that... me, sir. Oh, yes? Uh, there's a gentleman asking for you at the reception desk, Mr. Temple. Uh, Mr. Charles. Oh, sir. that's Rudolph Charles, Max Wyman's friend. The young fellow you spoke to on the telephone, Sir Graham. Oh, yes. Uh, ask him to join us, will you? Uh, very good, sir. You know... Judging from what young Ferguson said, it looks as if Mrs. Gulliver's mixed up in this business. Yes. Have you met her, Sir Graham? No, I haven't, Steve. But according to Inspector Gerard, she's rather a pleasant type of person. Was Richard Ferguson her only paying guest? Yes, but he wasn't exactly a paying guest. He rented the top of the house and turned it into a sort of flatlet. It was quite self-contained. I see. Paul, do you think that signet ring, or rather what was on the ring... Ties up with the card that Jonathan sent? Yes, I think it may, Steve, but I can't quite see how. What was on the ring? A4 and D4 scratched on the inside. Apart from that, it was just an ordinary signature ring. Here's Mr. Charles. Good morning, Mr. Charles. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Do sit down. Oh, you oh, know Sir Saint Graham Charles. Forbes. Oh, Sir Graham, how, how very fortunate. I, I almost telephoned you this morning, sir, but I thought perhaps I, I'd better have a word with Mr. Temple first. Yes, well, now you can have a word with both of us, Mr. Charles. Yes. Uh, uh, Sir Graham, uh, when I spoke to you on the phone, I told you that Max Wyman was in Scotland and that he was due back in Oxford sometime tonight. Yes. Well, it appears I was mistaken. Max isn't in Scotland. He is no, I telephoned the Martins late last night. They, they, they're the people he's supposed to be staying with. They haven't seen Max. He, he was expected on Tuesday, but he just didn't turn up. Where does he live? His home's at Staveley, just outside Windermere. Well, he probably changed his mind and went home for two or three days. No, his father, Lord Ellsworth, t telephoned me this morning. They, they haven't seen Max. They haven't even heard from him for almost a month. Mm -hmm. What's he like, Max Wyman? Oh, he's charming. You'd like him, Temple. Oh, everybody likes Max. I, I don't think there's a student in Oxford that Max doesn't know. I mean, really, no. Yes, that's why I wanted you to meet him. No, you misunderstand me, Sir Graham. I mean, what does he look like? He's about uh, 5 feet 11, uh, dark. Clean shaven. How old is he? Well, I should say he's about 22. He's just 23, Sir Graham. Mm, I see. How tall is Richard Ferguson? Oh, he's about 5 feet 11, uh, perhaps 6 foot. As a matter of fact, Ferguson always reminds me of Max, but Max is a much stronger personality. You know, oddly enough, when you see them together, there's a strange likeness between... Mr. Temple, you don't think it was Max... You don't think it was Max Wyman who was murdered? It's a possibility, Sir Graham. A strong possibility. <laughs> I'll give you a ring as soon as we've seen Mrs. Gulliver, Sir Graham. Yes, all right, Temple. If you want to get in touch with me during the morning, I should be with Gerard at police headquarters, Oxford 41299. Right. Well, I sincerely hope that you're wrong about Max Wyman. Yes, so do I, but I've got an uncanny feeling that I'm not. Your car's here, Mr. Temple. Oh, thank you. Ready, Steve? Yes, dear. See you later, Sir Graham. Yes. Goodbye, Steve. Goodbye. I want you to take us to three Mortimer Close. Three Mortimer Close. Very good, sir. Wait a minute, Paul. What is it? Isn't that Mark Elliot? Hmm? He's just driven up on the other side of the road. Oh, yes, so it is. I think he wants to have a word with you. Yes. You get in the car, Steve. I'll join you in a minute. Yes, all right. Hello. Where are you off to? Oh, nowhere in particular. Where are you off to? I'm going up to town for two or three days. Oh, I see. I'm very glad I spotted you, Temple. There's something I want to ask you. Well? Did you lose anything last night at the restaurant, I mean? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. I lost a ring. A signet ring? Yes. Is this it? Yes. <laughs> One of the waiters said he thought it was yours. He found it in the cocktail bar. The cocktail bar? You must have dropped it. Yes, I must have done. Well, I'm glad you got it back anyway. 
But what made you think this ring belonged to me? I've told you. One of the waiters said so. Yes, but it hasn't got any initials or anything on it. No, I noticed that. Francois said he saw you with the ring. He said you showed it to Dinah Nelson. Yes, that's right, I did. Well, there you are. Well, I'm delighted you've got it back. Anyway. Yes, thanks very much. You must have a very observant staff at the encounter. Oh, I don't know. We try to please. Goodbye, Temple. Goodbye. Number three, on the corner. Oh, thank you. You want me to wait? Yes, please. We shan't be very long. Okay, sir. I'll turn the car around. It'll be over on the other side. All right. Let's get out, Steve. Perhaps she's out, Paul. Hmm. Well, we'll wait a minute. Mm. If she is out, I'll dismiss the car and we'll go for a stroll and come back later. Yes. I think there's someone coming. Ah. Yes? What is it? Uh, could we see Mrs. Gulliver, please? Uh, is she expecting you? Uh, no, she isn't, but I think she'll see me. My name's Temple. Temple? Yes. Uh, tell her I'm a friend of Richard Ferguson's. Oh, well, uh, you better come in. Thank you. We're in a bit of a mess here. I'm just doing a spot of spring cleaning. Yes, I can see that. Do you work for Mrs. Gulliver? Uh, one day a week, that's all. Usually Tuesdays or Fridays. I'm with the Domestic Help Service. I say, did you say you was a friend of Richard Ferguson's? Yes. Well, what has happened to him? Is he dead or isn't he? That's what I like to know. The blinking papers just don't know what to make of it. Look, I'm afraid we haven't a lot of time. If you don't mind, we'd like to see Mrs. Gulliver. Yeah, OK, then. Well, I'll, I'll give her a shout. She's upstairs. Mrs. Gulliver? Mrs. Gulliver? Well, don't you think she'd hear you better if you switched the vacuum off? Oh, she'd hear me all right, but it put paid to the vacuum. Took me half an hour this morning to get the blinking thing started. Uh, Mrs. Gulliver! You better wait in the drawing room. I'll pop upstairs. Thank you. I shall be a jiffy. It's rather a nice room. Hmm. Paul, I've been thinking about that ring that... Elliot handed back to you. Are you sure it's the same ring? Positive. Oh, well. Perhaps he was telling the truth. Perhaps you did drop it in the cocktail bar. Hmm, perhaps. Well, if you didn't drop it, I fail to see what a... Listen. I thought I heard the front door closing. I'm rather doubtful about that young man. What do you mean? Why didn't he switch the vacuum off? Well, he told you why. <laughs> he spent half an hour trying to get it started. doesn't seem to be anyone coming. No. I'll answer it. Hello? Hello? Is that three Mortimer Close? Yes, that's right. Is Mrs. Gulliver there? Uh, she's upstairs at the moment. Well, could I speak to her, please? It's rather urgent. Well, I'll see if I can get her. Who is it speaking? This is Di... Hello? Hello? What's happened? She's rung off. Who was it? It sounded like Dinah Nelson. I'm sure it was. What did she want? She asked for Mrs. Gulliver. She said it was urgent. She sounded urgent, too. Look here, I don't like the look of all this. It's about time Mrs. Gulliver put in an appearance. Yes, I think so, too. Come on, Steve. I don't see any sign of our cockney friend. No. I'll bet that was the front door we heard. I'm going to switch this thing off. Oh, careful. Oh, it's all right. Yeah, that's better. Paul, listen. By Timothy. What is it? It must be Mrs. Gulliver. That's why he kept the vacuum on, so we shouldn't hear her. Oh, Paul. She must be in here. Oh, don't. Please don't. I haven't got the ring. I swear I haven't got it. Mrs. Gulliver, listen. Oh, please don't hurt. 
She's in a dreadful state. Steve, go downstairs. Phone Sir Graham. Tell him what's happened and tell him we need an ambulance. Yes. Quickly, Steve, quickly. Right. Of course, on the other hand, you've got to bear in mind that if you'd arrived at the house a few minutes earlier... Ah, here's the inspector. Well, Gerard? It doesn't look too good, sir. What does the doctor say? He's still non-committal. Is she still unconscious? Yes, and I'm afraid she will be for some time. I'm staying here at the hospital, sir, just in case... Yes, all right, Inspector. Good Lord, is that the time? I'd better be making a move. If you want me, I should be at the hotel. Very good, sir. What do you intend to do, Temple? I'm going back to the hotel, too. I'm taking Steve to the encounter later. You know, in spite of what's happened to Mrs. Gulliver, I've got a feeling that Richard Ferguson might keep that appointment. I doubt it, Temple. I doubt it very much. Have you still got the ring? Uh, yes. Do you want it? No, you keep it for the time being. Did you examine it, Inspector? Yes, we've made a detailed examination, sir. It looks to me like an ordinary signet ring, except for the markings. Yes, it does to me, sir. A temple, that man who let you into Mrs. Gulliver's, would you recognise him again? Yes, I'm sure I would. You've never seen him before? No, I don't think so. Come in. Excuse me, sir. Oh, come in, officer. Uh, Inspector Whiting asked me to deliver this message, sir. Oh, thank you. There's no reply. Thank you, sir. Well? That letter Temple gave you, sir, the one he got from Mrs. Ferguson. Yes? The Yard have examined it. It's negative. That means the first Jonathan card had the cipher. The second card that Macintosh gave us was negative, and the letter's negative. Yes. There's something else on this report, sir. Well? Temple was right. It was Max Wyman who was murdered. Good evening, Mr. Temple. Oh, good evening. Have you reserved a table, sir? Uh, yes, I have. Oh, yes, Mr. Temple, a table for two, that's right. Um, has there been any message for me? I don't think so, sir. Wait a moment. Uh, no, I'm afraid not, sir. Oh, all right, thank you. I'll be in the cocktail bar. Very good, sir. Good evening, sir. Oh, good evening. Dry martini, please. Yes, sir. Make that two, Bobby. Oh, very good, madam. Oh, hello, Mrs. Russell. Hello. Are you alone? Well, at the moment, I'm waiting for my wife. Do you mind if, if I join you? No, of course not. I, I'm glad I bumped into you. I'm glad I bumped into you too, Mr. Temple. I'm very lonely. Oh? I've been very lonely for a very long time. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sorry too. Still, I feel better now. Ever so much better. You're an oasis in my life, a mirage. <clears throat> uh, two dry martinis. Oh, thank you. Um, wouldn't you prefer an orange juice? Me? Yes. An orange juice? Yes. Whatever gave you that idea? Well, I, um, thought perhaps it might make a change. Oh, it would. A terrible change. A definite deterioration. I don't know whether you know it or not, Mrs. Russell, but you're just a little bit high. Oh, me? Hmm. A little bit... Yes. Oh. Well, it's not surprising. I've had six scotch and martini. What? Oh, no, that's not right, is it? I hope not. It can't be right. Bobby, can you mix scotch and martini? Well, you can, madam, but I don't advise it. Oh. Well, cheers. Cheers. I suppose you've heard about Mrs. Gulliver. No. She was brutally attacked. Attacked? Yes, yeah, she's critically ill. When did it happen? This morning. Do you know why she was attacked? No. They thought she had the signet ring. Who's they? Suppose you tell me, Mrs. Russell. Well, I don't know. I don't know anything. I'm just a simple little girl. No, you're, you're not simple. And if it comes to that, you're not little either. You're a big girl with big ideas. You got rid of that signet ring, didn't you? You knew it was dynamite, so you got rid of it. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I think you do. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yes, what is it? Uh, you're wanted on the telephone, Mr. Temple. Oh, thanks. But I'll see you later, Mrs. Russell. I hope so. Bobby, another scotch and martini. You can take the call in the box over here, sir. Oh, thank you. Hello? 
Mr. Temple? Yes? Hold on a moment, please. Your party's on the line now. Go ahead, please. Hello? Hello? Paul Temple? Yes? This is Richard Ferguson. Ah, I was wondering if I should hear from you. Temple, listen. How is Mrs. Gulliver? She's ill. Very ill. I was sorry to hear about that. Terribly sorry. Please believe me. Listen, Ferguson. What is it you want? Did you give Mrs. Gulliver the ring? No, I didn't. I've still got it. Temple, I've got to have that ring. It's important. I've got to have it. Well, you know where I am. Come and get it. No, I can't do that. Listen, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you what I'll do, Ferguson. I'll give you 20 minutes. If I don't see you in 20 minutes, I'll take this precious signet ring of yours and toss it in the river. No, don't do that. Don't do that, for heaven's sake. Temple, I'll tell you everything, but... Oh, look. Do you know the first AA box on the Bedford Road? Coming out of Oxford, it's on the right. Just near a clump of birch trees. Uh Uh-huh, I know the one you mean. I'll be there in 15 minutes. I'll park my car on the right near the trees. The car's a black saloon, YBW820. I'll be sitting in the car, waiting for you. All right, Ferguson, I'll be there. I'll be there in 20 minutes. should be very nearly there, darling, surely. Yes, I think it's about another quarter of a mile. But I was wrong. We just passed the box. There are the trees over there. I don't see any sign of the car. No. W- wait a minute. There it is. He's parked in the side, near the hedge. His lights are out. Oh, yes. Have you got the ring? Yes, I've got it, but young Ferguson isn't having it. Not until I know what all this is about. Stay here. I'll bring him back to the car. Oh, no, I'm coming with you. Now, don't be silly. I'm coming with you. Oh, all right. He must have seen us by now. Yes, he's getting out of the car. You asked for this, my friend, and now you're going to get it. Look out, Steve. He's got a revolver. It's Mark Elliot. That was the fourth episode of Paul Temple and the Jonathan Mystery by Francis Durbridge. The part of Paul Temple was played by Peter Cook and Steve by Marjorie Westbury. The play was produced for the BBC by Martin C. Webster. Episode 5, Concerning Richard Ferguson. He must have seen us by now, Paul. Yes. Oh, he's getting out of the car. You asked for this, my friend, and now you're going to get it. Look out, Steve, he's got a revolver. It's Mark Elliot. Temple. Why, I thought... Good heavens, I thought... Well, what did you think, Elliot? I thought you were someone else. I was sure that you were... Mrs. Temple, I'm terribly sorry frightening you like that. Is that revolver loaded? Yes. Who were you expecting? I'm sorry, Temple, I can't tell you. Was it Richard Ferguson? Yes. How did you know? You're not the only one who has an appointment with him. You mean you've come here to meet him? Yes, but whether you'll turn up is another matter. But, Temple, I can't believe you had an appointment with him tonight. You knew that sooner or later I should see young Ferguson and you deliberately followed me. That's not true. I had a phone call from him tonight at your restaurant. I promised to meet him here and give him this signet ring. That was about 20 minutes ago. Why does he want the ring? Your guess is as good as mine. It might even be better. Is that the truth? Yes. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I was rude just now. I, quite frankly, this business has upset me. I've been terribly worried. What business? Well, I told you. Ferguson's blackmailing me. Why, only this morning he... Oh, look, here, we, we can't talk standing about like this. Let's get into the car. Well, let's go back to our car. I've left my handbag there. Yes, all right, Steve. Come on, Elliot. 
Temple, what did Ferguson actually say to you when he spoke to you on the phone? But that's an amazing story. You mean to say that Mrs. Gulliver, Ferguson's landlady, was actually beaten up? I do. But why? Because someone was under the impression that she had the ring. That sounds incredible. It's like something out of a novel. I just can't believe it. Nevertheless, it's true. Now, tell me, did you intend to kill Ferguson? Oh, I don't know what I intended to do. I certainly didn't intend to give the young swine any more money. I thought perhaps if I threatened him, he'd come to his senses and... When did Ferguson first start to blackmail you? About six or seven weeks ago. You see, I... Well, I suppose I'd better tell you the truth. It all started at a party. One evening, I think it was about the last week in March, I went to a cocktail party given by Mavis Russell. She's quite a personality in Oxford, and she invited a lot of university people. When I arrived, a young man called Rudolf Charles was playing the piano. Rudolph, what is that thing you're playing? I'll give you a clue. It's Mendelssohn. Oh, of course, I remember. It's one of the songs without words. Clever girl. <laughs> Darling, must you keep sitting at the piano? Edward, see to the drinks. I'm sure everybody's dying of thirst. Yes, madam. Mavis, you're a bitter disappointment to me. I always thought you had an ear for music. I have, darling, and you play like an angel. But I want you to meet people. Hello, Mark. How nice to see you. My dear, I've been here for 20 minutes. I'm looking for a light sherry and a very pretty girl in a green dress. Well, we can certainly get you the sherry. Edward? It's all right, Mavis. I'll see to it. Thank you, darling. No, never, never, never. I don't see any sign of your protégé, Mavis. I suppose you mean Richard Fergus. I do. He hasn't arrived yet. And, Mark, he isn't my protégé. I've told you that before. I encourage him because, well, because I think he's got something. Oh, he has. He unquestionably has. He's got a confounded cheek. Why do you say that? Well, he phoned me this morning and said he wanted to see me. When I said I couldn't see him, not for a day or two at any rate, he got quite impertinent. What? Oh, here's Richard now. Mavis, my sweet, I'm terribly sorry. I'm late. We had an awful time getting here. One of the... Oh, yes, I've, I've brought Dinah along. You don't mind, do you, darling? We're having dinner together, so it seems silly for us to... No, of course not. I'm delighted. Uh, what would you like to drink, Miss... Uh, Nelson. Oh, yes. Miss Nelson. May I have a gin and tonic? Yes, of course. Excuse me, madam. Yes, what is it? Mr. Elliot's wanted on the telephone, madam. I've switched it through to the study. Oh, thank you, Edward. Do you know where it is, Mark? No, I'm afraid I don't. It's all right, I'll show you. I shan't be a moment, Dinah. Yes, all right, Richard. This way, Mr. Elliot. <laughs> oh, thank you, Ferguson. Not at all. Where's the phone? It's over there in the corner. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, but I shouldn't bother with it if I were you. What do you mean? Well, I asked Edward to give you that message. You asked? Do you mean to say that I'm not wanted on the telephone? Sit down, Mr. Elliot. What do you mean, sit down? It's a perfectly simple statement. Sit down. I want to talk to you. Now, look here, young man. If you think these blockbusting tactics of yours are going to get you anywhere, you're very much mistaken. Mr. Elliot, you're being aggressive and unfriendly. I want to have a talk with you. A pleasant talk, I hope. This isn't a very good beginning. Oh, well, what is it you want? Fifteen hundred pounds. I beg your pardon? I said fifteen hundred pounds. You want me to lend you fifteen hundred pounds? I don't want you to lend me anything. I want you to give me fifteen hundred pounds. Give you? My dear boy, you're crazy. Now, come along. Don't let's waste any more time. Let's get back to the party. Uh, Mr. Elliot. Well? Uh, if this was in a book written by Mavis and published by your friend Mr. Keene, sooner or later I'd find myself saying, blackmail is a very ugly word, Mr. Elliot. Well... Just between ourselves, I don't think it's an ugly word at all. I think it's rather a delightful word. It gets straight to the point. Yes, in short, I'm blackmailing you. I want £1,500. And supposing I refuse? Do you remember a girl called Cynthia Stevens? Well, just in case you don't, let me refresh your memory. Fifteen years ago, uh, you were invited to a house party in Norfolk. A girl, a very young girl, called Cynthia Stevens, was also invited. And during the course of what I should imagine was not entirely an uneventful weekend, Miss Stevens committed suicide. 
At the inquest, you said that she was a comparative stranger, and that you'd actually met her for the first time that weekend. Well, that wasn't true. You'd met her several times before. On one occasion, you'd even taken her over to Brussels for two or three days. Look, quite frankly, I don't know what you're talking about. I vaguely remember a girl called Cynthia Stevens, but it's a long time ago. I was very young then, You were and I... 31. Miss Stevens was 17. Sweet 17. I suppose you've got the letters. I've got three letters. I don't know whether you wrote any more or not. You want £1,500 for them? No, I didn't say that. Oh, what do you mean? I've got the letters... And I want £1,500. That doesn't mean to say I want £1,500 for the letters. Well, what the devil do you want? £1,500 to be going on with. Well, think it over, Mr. Elliot. Think it over. Now, shall we take your advice and join the party? My word, it does sound gay, doesn't it? Uh, I'll get you a light sherry. Uh, would you prefer something stronger? I paid Ferguson the fifteen hundred pounds. Well, three weeks later, I paid him another hundred. How do you know that he has the letters? Has he shown them to you? He's got them all right. What happened today, Elliot? Did he phone you? Yes. Yes, I was in town. He phoned me about three o'clock. He said he was desperate, that he needed seven hundred pounds. He told me to meet him here tonight at nine o'clock. <laughs> Frankly, Temple... I'm not used to this sort of thing. I, I just don't know how to cope with it. Mm, you seem to be coping with it rather well. What do you mean? Judging by the revolver, you'd obviously made up your mind to take care of young person. I, I must have been crazy. I, I must have been out of my mind even to think of such a thing. But you know, Temple, I, I've got to get those letters back. What am I going to do? Well, I don't think you're going to get them back tonight. It's a uh, quarter past eleven already. Mr. Elliot, you say Richard phoned you this afternoon and arranged to meet you here. Yes. Well, then how do you account for the fact that he asked us to meet him here at the same time? Oh, I can't account for it, Mrs. Temple. We know why he phoned us. He wants the ring. It's simply a question of why he picked this particular place at this particular time. I, I can't imagine why. Well, he's obviously not going to keep the appointment. I think it's about time we made a move, Steve. Yes. Temple, hmm? would you mind driving me back into Oxford? I really don't feel like driving. Yes, yeah, certainly. But what about your car? Oh, I'll get my chauffeur to pick it up tomorrow morning. It'll be all right not actually parked on the road. All right, Elliot. Thank you, Temple. Thank you very much. Slow down, Paul. I think we're coming to the crossroads. No, it's about another quarter of a mile, Mrs. Temple. Oh, is it? Elliot, the night we first met at the encounter, you told me that Richard was blackmailing you, and you inferred that Mrs. Russell knew all about it. I did? Yes. You said you had a motive for murdering young Ferguson. When I asked you what the motive was, you said... Do you mean to tell me that Mavis Russell hasn't told you? I'm sorry I said that, because I don't really think it was true. You mean you don't think Mrs. Russell did know that you were being blackmailed? It's difficult to say. Mavis knows a great deal of what goes on in Oxford, at least what goes on in our particular circle. She may know that I'm being blackmailed. Probably thinks young Ferguson simply putting the pressure on me. Ferguson's a careerist, you know. He likes to think that he... Hello. What's happened here? Slow down, Paul. There's been an accident by the look of things. By Timothy, look. That car's on fire. The police are here, Temple. I wonder what's happened. What's happened, officer? My name's Paul Temple. Good evening, Mr. Temple. We don't know, sir. Rather looks as if the petrol tank exploded, sir. Is there anyone in the car? Yes, I'm afraid there is, sir. We've been trying to get him out, but we can't get near enough. Wait a minute. What is it, Paul? I want to have a look at that car. Just look at those fellows. I don't know how the devil they do it. Stand back over there! Please, stand back over there! The heat must be terrific. Yes, yeah, awful. Keep it steady! Where's Paul? Here he is. Get out of the car, Elliot. I want you a moment. Darling, what is it? It's young Ferguson's car. What? I tell you, it's Ferguson's car. I checked the number. It's the one he gave me on the phone. What do you want me to do? There's a man in the car, Elliot. When they get him out, I want you to take a look at him. 
All right, boys, take him steady. They're getting him out. Yes. Stand back there, please, Stand You must stand here in the car. Excuse me, isn't it Mr. Temple? Why, hello, Macintosh. What are you doing here? Well, I'm supposed to be on my way back to London, but this held me up. It's a nasty business. Yes, it is indeed. It's a very nasty business. I don't see how it happened. The petrol tank couldn't have been the cause of it, because we heard it blow up a few moments ago. Now what's happening? They've got him out of the car. I poor devil. Come on, Elliot. You'd better come too, Macintosh. Oh, what do you mean? I want you both to take a look at this man. I've got a hunch you'll recognize him. Recognize him? What on earth does he mean, Mr. Elliot? Uh, excuse me, please. Ex- excuse me. I'm sorry, sir. You can't come through here. That's all right, George. I'm afraid we were too late, Mr. Temple. He's dead. I want these two gentlemen to take a look at him. Yes, all right. Well, I don't know care about five is now. Please, stand back. There you are, sir. Oh, my God. Oh. You were right, Temple. Do you recognize him, Macintosh? Yes, of course. It's Richard Ferguson. Good night, Mr. Temple. If you want to get in touch with me, I'll be at the same hotel, the Cromwell. I thought you were going back to London. I was, but I've changed my mind. I don't want Dinah to hear about this from anyone else. I was very fond of Richard. This is going to be a terrible blow. Excuse me, sir. Yes? You're quite certain that it is Richard Ferguson? Quite certain. There's no mistake this time. There's no doubt about it, officer. Thank you, sir. May I have a word with you, Mr. Temple? Yes, of course. I'll see you at the car, Elliot. Yes, all right. Good night. Good night, Macintosh. Mr. Temple, Ferguson was dead before the car caught fire, sir. What do you mean? I've just taken another look at the body, sir. He was shot... My dear Sir Graham, I came to this ghastly little police station because I was under the impression that I might be able to help. You certainly can be of some help, Mrs. Russell, by answering my questions. But you keep asking me the same question over and over again. I told you, I haven't the slightest idea why Richard Ferguson wanted the signet ring. I see. Mrs. Russell, do you mind if I ask you a question? No. Did you know that Mr. Elliot was being blackmailed by Richard Ferguson? Mark being (laughs) blackmailed... Don't be absurd. What do you mean? Have you met Mark Elliot? You know I have. Well, does he strike you as being the sort of man who would let himself be blackmailed by a student? Mark's a cool, calculating businessman. He wouldn't be blackmailed by anybody. But he might do a spot of it himself. Supposing it was Elliot who told me that he was being blackmailed. That he also told me that you knew that he was being blackmailed. Then I should say that he was not only a cool, calculating businessman, but a cool, calculating liar. Look, it's a quarter past four, Sir Graham. I have an appointment with my hairdresser at half past. I should rather like to keep it. Yes, all right, Mrs. Russell. I suppose we know where to get in touch with you. You do indeed. Goodbye, Mr. Temple. I'm sorry you've been so badly misinformed. I'll try and make up for it. I don't like that woman. If she's an intellectual, thank heavens I didn't marry one. (laughs) The main thing is not to underrate her. Temple, do you think she's mixed up in this business? I mean, really mixed up in it. Yes, I do. You don't think that she's Jonathan? Well, she could be, Sir Graham. On the other hand... Yes? What is it, Sergeant? Mr. and Mrs. Ferguson here, sir. They're in the inspector's office. All right, Sergeant. We'll come down. Very good, sir. Come along, Temple. I don't believe that Richard was mixed up in anything that was dishonest. I I knew my own son. He may have been impetuous. Helen, please. I know this is very painful for you, Mrs. Ferguson, but I'm afraid you've got to face the facts, and the facts are not very pleasant. I suppose you've read the report in the newspapers about the car accident? Yes. Well, it wasn't an accident. We rather gathered that from what the inspector said. Your son was shot. Shot? no. I'm afraid it's true. 
According to our medical report, he was shot before the car was set on fire. Whether the person who shot him started the fire, we don't know. Of course the fire was started by the same person. He wanted the whole thing to look like an accident. Now you can Sir Graham, I don't want to be offensive, but I don't think you people have been too bright over this business. Really? Well, when you discovered that Richard wasn't murdered, I mean in the first place... You ought to have picked him up. You ought to have had every cop in town on the lookout for him. But we did. We tried to pick him up. Don't forget the police thought Richard was dead. You thought so too, Ferguson. You refused to believe that he was alive, even when your wife saw him. Yeah, I know that, but... Oh, look, Temple, let's have our cards on the table. What's this business all about? Why was our boy murdered? Well, in my opinion, he was murdered because someone was under the impression that he had the signet ring. The... The signet ring? Yes. You mean his own ring? Yes. Well, why shouldn't he have it? I don't get this. I think you guys are barking up the wrong tree. I think there's a girl mixed up in this somewhere. Yes, I think so too, Mr. Temple. A little while ago, Richard wrote us a letter about a girl called Dinah Nelson. He appeared to be very friendly with her. Yes, I think he was. Haven't you met Miss Nelson? No, we haven't. And then there's this other woman, this Mrs. Russell... Do you think she knows anything about this? Yes, it's possible. Well, why don't you get her down here? Why don't you question her? We have questioned her. She left here only a few minutes ago. Oh, sorry. Oh, Mr. Ferguson, I want you to take a look at this. What is it? Now, take a look at it. It's a photostatic copy of a message that was on the first Jonathan card. What? What is it, Robert? Oh, it's just a list of letters and numbers, so far as I can see. Is this supposed to mean something? Let Mrs. Ferguson have a look at it. Thank you. Well, does that make sense to you? Not to me, it doesn't. Nor to me. I see. Now, Mrs. Ferguson, tell me, hmm? when was the last time you saw your son? Why, that night. The night I saw him standing outside of the hotel. You've never seen him since? No. You know that he telephoned your husband one night and asked him to meet him at a house in Lewisham? Yes. Robert, tell me. Were you surprised? Yes, of course I was. Hey, what is this? Mr. Ferguson had a heart attack and was unable to keep the appointment. Mr. Temple kept it. But instead of seeing your son, he found the dead body of a man called Red Harris. Yes, I know. Had you ever heard of Red Harris? No, never. So, in spite of the fact that he telephoned your husband, Richard made no attempt to get in touch with you, Mrs. Ferguson. No, he didn't. I see. Well, thank you both. We'll be in touch with you. If anything important develops, we'll most certainly let you know. Uh, we thought of going back to London tonight. Is that okay? Yes, yes, yes. I, I take it you're still at the same hotel. Oh, yes, for the time being, at any rate. Oh, goodbye, Temple. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mrs. Ferguson. Goodbye. I'll be back in a moment, Temple. Right. Oh, hello, Mrs. Ferguson. I, uh, I think I left my handbag. Your handbag? Oh, yes. yes, here it is. Oh, thank you. Mr. Temple. Yes? Get in touch with Dinah Nelson. Tell her I sent you. Did you tell Sir Graham what Mrs. Ferguson said? No, I didn't. It doesn't make sense, does it? First of all, she said she didn't know Dinah Nelson, and then later she said, get in touch with her and tell her she sent you. Yes. Well, why on earth do you think she said that? I don't know. Oh, hello. This looks like the place. Weldon Court. Mm. Looks impressive. Mm, it does, doesn't it? Good evening, sir. Can oh. I help you? Yes, good evening. Uh, Miss Nelson, is that number three? Uh, yes, sir. Flat three, first floor. Oh, thank you. Do you happen to know if Miss Nelson's in? Mm, yes, she is, sir. She came in about quarter past seven. Oh. Well, I should take the lift, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, madam.
Ah, this is three. It certainly has an expensive look. Mm. The rents must be pretty steep. Yes. As you said, she couldn't live here just on her salary. No. I should ring again, Paul. She can't be in. Mm. Doesn't look like it. Well, the porter must have been mistaken. She's probably got... What is it? Do you smell anything? Oh, it's gas. Yes. What are you doing? Uh, the key's in the lock. Well, you don't think she's tried to commit suicide? I do. Here. Hold this newspaper, Steve. Yes? Yeah. That's right. Now, now, spread it out on the floor. Well, what are you going to do? I'm going to put it under the door and try to get the key to fall on it. I I'll do it. Yes, that's it. Now, steady, steady. Keep, keep it flat. It's under. Right. Now. Ah. You've done it. Yes. Now, pull the paper out from under the door. Mm -hmm. Gen gently, gently, Steve. Now, not, not too fast. Mm -hmm. They're careful. I've got it. Ah. Good. <coughs> oh. <coughs> oh. <coughs> Stay where you are, Steve. She's over there, and oh, near, near the gas fire. Yes, I, I'll open, open the window. <coughs> I've turned off the gas. Oh. Oh. Help me to get her over yeah. to the window. <coughs> All right. I don't know. Miss Nelson. Oh. Here, Miss Nelson. Careful, you, you hurt her. I, I've got to... Get up uh, near uh, the window. It's beginning to clear. Yeah. Uh, Miss Nelson. Oh. Yeah. Miss Miss Nelson. She's coming round. <coughs> yes. Yes, I think she's. <coughs> Where am I? I well. <coughs> no, no, it's all right. It's all right. Now, just just take it easy. Take it easy. Just take a, a, a deep breath. I, I must have fainted. I must... Oh, I, I remember. I remember now. I tried to... Oh, everything's going round, Mr. Temple. I can't see properly. I feel dizzy. Is she going to be all right, Paul? Yes. Yeah, she'll be all right. Go into the bedroom, Steve. <coughs> See if she left a note for anyone. Yes, all right. <coughs> now, come along. Relax, Miss Nelson. Come on, just close your eyes. There. That's it. Oh. I feel better now. Now, good. Now, just sit quiet for a moment or so. Mr. Temple, I tried to commit suicide. Mm. I made up my mind that I, I couldn't stand things any longer. That, that I, I... Paul? Yes? Here a moment. What is it, Steve? You were right. There is a note. It was on the dressing table in the bedroom. Well? It's for Jonathan... That was the fifth episode of Paul Temple and the Jonathan Mystery by Francis Durbridge. The part of Paul Temple was played by Peter Cook and Steve by Marjorie Westbury. The play was produced for the BBC by Martin C. Webster. Episode 6, A Surprise for Mavis Russell.
relax, Miss Nelson. Just close your eyes. There, that's it. Oh, well, I, I feel better now. Good. Just sit quiet for a moment or so. Oh, Mr. Temple, I tried to commit suicide. Mm. I made up my mind that I couldn't stand things any longer. Paul? That I... Yes? Here a moment. What is it, Steve? You were right. There is a note. It was on the dressing table in the bedroom. Well? It's for Jonathan. Jonathan? Let me see. This is the only way out for me. I just can't stand things any longer, Dinah. Mr. Temple? Uh, coming, Miss Nelson. Could I have a glass of water, please? Yes, of course. I'll get it for you. The kitchen's on the left, Mrs. Temple. All right. Are you feeling any better? I still feel a little sick. Yes, of course, but you'll feel all right in a few minutes. You, you just turned up in time. The note. I left a note in the bedroom. Please get it for me. It's here. Oh, give it to me, please. I'm afraid I've already read it. What? It's addressed to Jonathan. Who is Jonathan? I don't know. One doesn't usually leave a suicide note to a person one doesn't know. Mr. Temple, please don't ask me any questions. Please don't. I'm afraid I've got to. Who is Jonathan? And why did Richard Ferguson want the ring? I don't know. I tell you, I don't know. Please leave me alone. Here's some water. Ah. Here we are, Dinah. Now drink this. Oh, thank you. You feel better? Yes. I think you'd better go into the bedroom and lie down for a little while. If there's anything you want, we can get it for you. Yes. Yes, I'd like to do that, Mrs. Temple. Right. Now, oh, give me your arm. Oh, oh, oh I feel weak. <laughs> it's all right, Diana. Don't worry. Go and turn the bed down, Steve. Come on. I'll carry her in. How do you feel now? Oh, better, thanks. This hot water bottle's heavenly. It's awfully good of you, Mrs. Temple. I do appreciate it. I still think I ought to get a doctor. No, please don't. I'll be all right, honestly, I will. Good. Now, Miss Nelson... You called me Dinah just now. I wish you'd both go on calling me Dinah. It's much more friendly. Very well, Dinah. Tell me, do you know why we came here tonight? No. But I'm very glad you did. We came because Mrs. Ferguson told me to get in touch with you. Mrs. Ferguson? Yes. Well, why should she do that? Don't you know why? No, I don't. I don't know Mrs. Ferguson. I've never even met her. And you've no idea why she told us to get in touch with you? No, I've told you. I haven't. Oh. <laughs> now, Dinah, just relax. Dinah, when was this photograph taken? Which, which one? This one here. Oh, that was taken about six months ago. It's Richard Ferguson with you, isn't it? Yes. What are you doing? Just... Looking at the photograph? Yes, I know, but I didn't know real detectives use magnifying glasses. Oh, invariably. And bloodhounds. We left ours in the hall. <laughs> oh, Mr. Temple, you must have thought me very rude just now. I'm very ungrateful. What do you mean? When I refuse to answer your questions. No, I didn't think you were rude or ungrateful. I just thought you were being rather stupid. Look, Dinah, I'm sure I can help you over this business. Why don't you let me? That's the front door. Yes. Are you expecting anyone? Yes. I'm expecting Reggie. I've forgotten about that. Do you want to see him? Yes. Yes, I suppose I'll have to see him. Stay with Dinah, Steve. Yes, all right. Oh, hello. Hello, Macintosh. Good evening, Mr. Charles. Oh, we didn't expect to find you here, Mr. Temple. No, we have a date with Dinah and You'd we... You'd better come in. This is a strong smell of gas. Temple, what is it? What's happened? Your friend Dinah tried to commit suicide. What? I don't believe it. I'm afraid it's true. Is she all right? Yes, she's all right. There's nothing to worry about. Fortunately, we arrived in time. Uh, where is she? She's in the bedroom. My wife's with her. Wait a moment, Macintosh. Well? I want to have a word with you. Well, are you sure Dinah's all right? I've already told you that. Oh, it's a very good thing you turned up when you did, Mr. Temple. A very good thing, Mr. Charles. Incidentally, I didn't know you two knew each other. We met in a golf tournament about six months ago. We've been firm friends ever since. Uh -huh. 
Had you a date with Miss Nelson? Yes, we both arranged to take her to the encounter. When did you make the date? This afternoon. I telephoned her. How did she seem? Well, she sounded a bit down, I thought. Of course, she was terribly upset when she heard about young Ferguson. There's no doubt about it. That's why she tried to commit suicide. I don't agree, McIntosh. What? I may be wrong, but I don't think young Ferguson's death had anything to do with her attempt to commit suicide. Well, what other explanation can there be? Miss Nelson left a note. A note addressed to someone called Jonathan. Jonathan? I've never heard of anyone called Jonathan. Yes, you told me that once before, Mr. Charles. What did the note say? It said that she just couldn't stand things any longer. Oh, what things? What did she mean? You'd better ask her yourself. Well, I certainly will. Incidentally, please don't think I'm impertinent, but you seem to see quite a lot of your sister-in-law, don't you, McIntosh? Yes, I've been waiting for you to raise that point. Oh? Uh -huh. Not that it's any business of yours, mark you. For almost two years after the accident, I never went anywhere. I... What accident? Mrs. McIntosh had a motor car accident. She was badly injured. If Reggie didn't take Dinah out occasionally, he, well, he, he just wouldn't go anywhere. I see. I hope you do see, Mr. Temple. Dinah's a very nice girl. Paul? Oh, good evening, Mrs. Temple. What is it, Steve? Dinah's asking for Mr. McIntosh. Oh, we're just coming. She's rather upset again. She's crying. All right, Steve. <laughs> now, Dinah, my dear, there's no need to get upset. No need at all. You did a very silly thing. But thanks to Mr. and Mrs. Temple, it's turned out for the best. Now, now just try and pull yourself together. Reggie, I don't want to answer any questions. I don't want to talk about anything. All right, Dinah, now just relax. Oh, don't ask me any more questions, Mr. Temple. Please don't. I can't answer them. Not tonight. All right. We're going back to the hotel. If you change your mind and feel like talking, well, you know where to find us. Yes, it's all right. Rudolph, I'm staying with Dinah. We'd better forget our dinner date. Yes, of course, Reggie. Uh, have you got your car, Mr. Temple? Uh, no, as a matter of fact, we haven't. Well, I'll give you a lift back to the hotel. Oh, thank you. Macintosh, if she changes her mind and decides to talk... I'll be in touch with you straight away. You can depend on it. All right, thank you. You ready, Steve? Yes. Good night, Dinah. Good night, Mrs. Temple. You may not think so, but I'm really terribly grateful to you. Well, take care of yourself. When you feel better, give us a ring. Yes, yes, all right. Good night, Dinah. Good night. Now I'll get you a nice cup of tea, Dinah. You'll feel a different girl when you've had a cup of tea. No, no, not just now, Reggie. Please, stay with me. I don't want to be alone. Yes, all right. Now, just as you please, my dear. Just as you please. This car runs very smoothly, Charles. Oh, yes, I'm very pleased with it. What make is it? It's a Lombard, Mrs. Temple. Oh, a Lombard. Hmm, I thought it was. How long have you had it? About uh, six months. I must say, it's, it's extremely comfortable, isn't it, Steve? Yes, very. Did you buy it in Oxford? No, I, I bought it in London. Oh. Second hand? Yes, second hand. You don't see many Lombards about, do you? Oh, I suppose not. I suppose they're too big for most people. Perhaps. A friend of mine used to have one, a very nice car, too. His name was Red Harris. Well, the thing I like about him is a quick getaway. It's, it's absolutely first rate. Yes. I say, I hope you don't mind my asking, but what do you do exactly? I am an architect. Oh? Well, I thought you were an undergraduate, Mr. Charles. I was. I came down two years ago. Ah, uh, here's your hotel, Mr. Temple. Ah. Well, thanks for the lift. Not at all. Good night, Mrs. Temple. Good night. You seemed very interested in the car, Paul. Yes, I was. Do you know why? No. Because I've seen it before, that's why. Mm -hmm. I've been in it before. It's the car that Red Harris had. The car we sat in the night he told me about the ring. You mean it's the same car? The same car. It's a different colour and it's got a different number. But by Timothy, Steve, it's the same car. Good evening, Mr. Temple. Good evening, uh, good evening madam. Good evening. Could I have my key, please? Uh, certainly, sir. Uh, the gentleman in 33 would like to have a word with you, Mr. Temple. He's in his room now, sir. Oh, thank you. Is that Sir Graham? Yes. 
If there are any telephone calls for me in the next half hour or so, put them through to room 33, will you? Oh, very good, sir. Oh, Temple. Oh, hello, Ferguson. Temple, could I have a word with you? Yes, of course. Let's go into the small lounge, shall we? Is anything wrong, Mr. Ferguson? Well, I don't know, Mrs. Temple. I guess I'm just imagining things. At least I hope so. Well, sit down. <sighs> no. What's it all about? Well, H Helen, my wife, she seems to have disappeared. Hmm? What do you mean, disappeared? Well, this afternoon, just after we left you and Sir Graham at the police station, Helen said she wanted to do some shopping. I guess that'd be about uh, quarter past four. Well, I told her to go ahead and said I'd meet her here at the hotel at about half past five. Well? Well, it's a quarter to nine and she hasn't turned up. Yes, but surely that doesn't mean she's disappeared. She may have met some friends or gone to the pictures. We don't know anyone in Oxford, Mrs. Temple. And Helen certainly wouldn't go to a movie on her own. Well, I'm sure there's a perfectly simple explanation, Ferguson. I shouldn't worry about it. I don't know. Helen's been acting mighty queer just lately. She... Well, when she heard about Richard, I thought she was going to have a breakdown. A, a real breakdown, I mean. Mm. Ferguson, when I asked her this afternoon if she knew Dinah Nelson, she said that she'd never met her. That's right. Have you met her? No, I haven't. How long ago is it since you saw... Oh, so here you are, Temple. Oh, hello, Elliot. You don't look very pleased with life, Mr. Elliot. I'm not feeling very pleased with life, Mrs. Temple. I'm not very pleased with your husband, either. Oh? What have I done? Well, last night I told you in strict confidence about my relationship with Richard Ferguson. Well? Well, tonight Mrs. Ferguson, Richard's mother, calmly walks into the encounter, apologises for her son's behaviour, and presents you with a cheque for £1,900. You mean to say that my wife... I don't get this. You're not the only one, Ferguson. Are you Richard Ferguson's father? I am, sir. And I suppose you're in on this. Now, just a minute, Elliot, just a minute. Calm down. Now, let's get this straightened out. In the first place, I did not tell Mrs. Ferguson or anyone else that you'd been blackmailed by Richard. What do you mean, blackmailed? According to Mr. Elliot, your son was a blackmailer. Uh, He'd already had £1,900. Right? That's a lie! I'm afraid it isn't a lie, Mr. Ferguson. It's the truth. But now that the boy's dead, there's no need even to discuss the matter. There it certainly... It was decent of your wife to offer me the money back, but, well, all I want to do about this business is forget it. What do you mean, forget it? Richard was murdered. If this story of yours is true, that means you had a motive for murdering him. I had, but I didn't murder him. When... when did you see my wife? About 20 minutes ago. Is she still at the encounter? As far as I know, she was in the cocktail bar when I left. Right. I'll see you later, Temple. All right, Ferguson. Mr. Elliot, did Mrs. Ferguson tell you that it was through my husband that she knew about Richard blackmailing you? No, I'm afraid I assumed that. Well, you were wrong. But if you didn't tell her, Temple, then who did? Yes, that's quite a question. Who did? So if Elliot's telling the truth, Sir Graham, then quite obviously someone told Helen Ferguson about Richard. Yes. Where's Ferguson at the moment? He's gone to the encounter to pick up his wife. Hmm. Did he seem very upset when he thought she was missing? He certainly did. Mm. Sir Graham, tell me, is there any news about Mrs Gulliver? Yes, that's one of the things I wanted to see you about. She never regained consciousness. She died this afternoon, Temple. Oh, poor soul. I'm sorry about that. She was certainly mixed up in this business, but to what extent, we don't really know. Mm. Did you check on the car number, Sir Graham? Yes, Steve, I did. And that's really what I wanted to see you about. Here's a copy of the card. Now, uh, take a good look at it, Temple. Mm -hmm. 789 ALE. That's a procedure. It was stolen two weeks ago from a garage in Chelsea. Ah, 267 on. FLO. There's no record of that number at all. 316 FXH. That's an American Bretelac. Uh -huh. Stolen about six weeks ago. 574 DXD, no record. 769 DLC, a roll stolen three weeks ago. You uh, see this significance, Temple? I'm beginning to. You mean the numbers you've got no record of are, are the... the phony numbers, substituted for the genuine ones. Mm. 
So that means the postcard was sent to Richard Ferguson so that he'd know which was which. Yes, it's my bet that young Ferguson was in this car racket, in it up to his neck. But, Sir Graham, what about logbooks? I mean, every car has to have one. <laughs> yes. Well, if they can forge pound notes and dollars, Steve, they can certainly forge logbooks. Mm, things are beginning to tie up. How do you mean? You remember the car that Red Harris had? It was a Lombard. Yes. You said it was 246 ELF? Yes, well, it isn't any longer. Oh? It belongs to Rudolf Charles. It's been re-sprayed and the number's been changed. Are you sure it's the same I'd car? I'd stake my life on it. Hmm. But how does the signet ring fit into all this? Well, it's my opinion that it was a means of identification. Identification? Hmm. What do you mean? Well, you told us that a man called André Dumas was mixed up in the stolen car racket and that he'd been arrested. That's right. The French people have been after him for some time. We first heard of Dumas about six months ago. There was some talk of him coming over here and the surete tipped us off. Hmm. Well, I've been thinking about Dumas. I'm not so sure that he isn't connected with this Jonathan affair in some way or other. Why do you say that, Paul? Do you remember what was on the signet ring, Steve? Yes, uh, two letters and two numbers. A4 and D4. Yes, A4, D4. Well, perhaps it's only a coincidence, but A and four letters might stand for André. And D4, D and four letters uh, Dumas. Yes. Hmm. I, I wonder if you're right. Yes. Oh, by the way, Sir Graham, when I was at Dinah Nelson's, I picked up a photograph of Richard Ferguson. It was taken six months ago. Well? Well, he wasn't wearing a ring. Are you sure? You can easily be mistaken in a photograph. Oh, I wasn't mistaken. I examined the photograph through a magnifying glass. Oh, excuse me. Hello? Uh, there's a call for Mr. Temple, sir. Oh, just a moment. It's um for you, Temple. Oh, thank you. Hello? Just a moment, sir. Is that you, Mr. Temple? Oh, hello, Macintosh. How's Miss Nelson? Oh, she seems to be very much better, very much better indeed. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. As a matter of fact, that's why I've telephoned you. She wants to see you, Mr. Temple. I've convinced her that the best thing she can do is to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with you. Good. Are you speaking from her flat? Yes. Um, I'll be with you in about half an hour. Right. Oh, uh, you'll be on your own, I take it. Well, uh, except for my wife. No, no, I didn't mean that. I mean... You won't bring anybody else along. Uh, Sir Graham, for instance. No, 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 we'll be on our own. I think it would be best if you don't mind. I'll see you in 30 minutes. OK. What is it, Paul? Dinah Nelson wants to see us. According to our friend Macintosh, he's persuaded her to talk. Macintosh has? Yes. I wonder. <laughs> Oh, um, here's my key, Porter. Thank you, Mr. Temple. Will you get us a taxi, please? Oh, very good, sir. What about the car, darling? Oh, I don't think there's much point in getting the car out, Steve. It only means that... Oh. Hello, Mrs. Russell. Hello, Mr. Temple. Good evening, Mrs. Temple. Good evening. Did I hear you ordering a taxi? Yes. Well, where are you going? Perhaps I can give you a lift. Oh. Uh, do you know Weldon Court? Yes, of course. It's just over the river. I'm going past there. I'd be delighted to drop you. Oh, are you sure it's not out of your way? Not at all. Mm. Porter, we shan't need the taxi. Oh, very good, sir. Thank you. Have you been dining here, Mrs. Russell? No, I've been addressing a literary society. I usually do that sort of thing about once a month. Oh. <laughs> For my sins. <laughs> it's been rather fun tonight. I was going great guns until some long-haired genius asked me my opinion of Schopenhauer. Oh, oh dear. I was brilliant, considering I've never read him. <laughs> Probably never read himself. That's exactly. more than likely. Do you think the police will ever find out who murdered Richard Ferguson? Yes, I do. But it isn't only a question of finding out who murdered him. What do you mean? We want to know what's behind all this. Why Max Wyman was murdered. And why someone called Jonathan sent Ferguson a mysterious postcard. If you ask me, the police attach far too much importance to this Jonathan person. Well, that's a point of view. When did you first hear about Richard Ferguson, Mrs. Russell? You mean about the murder? Yes. First thing this morning. Mark Elliott telephoned me. Were you surprised? Oh, yes, of course I was surprised. 
I thought that you were very fond of Richard Ferguson. Yes, I was. Well, forgive my saying so, Mrs. Russell, but you don't seem unduly perturbed by the fact that he's been murdered? I'm not easily perturbed, as you call it. I'm the unemotional type that takes a great deal to upset me. Quite the opposite from Dinah Nelson, in fact. What do you mean? She was so upset when she heard about Richard that she tried to commit suicide. What? Oh, I don't believe it. It's true. Well, is she all right? She will be. Stupid girl. Yes. I wish that car would get a move on or let me pass. <laughs> Are you all right at the back, Mrs. Temple? Yes, thanks. I'm afraid there isn't a lot of room. That's all right. But I keep putting my feet on your hat box. I hope it won't mark. My hat box? Hmm. Is there a hat box at the back? That's a small one. It's half under your seat. That's funny. I, I don't remember. Wait a minute. Where is it, Steve? There it is. It's a small brown case with a leather buckle. <laughs> well, I don't know how it got there. It's not mine. Pull up. But we're just going over the bridge. Surely Do as I say. To... Pull up. Oh, what are you going to do? Mind your feet, Steve. Let me get the case. Here you are. Have you seen this before? No, I haven't. It doesn't look like a hat box. It doesn't sound like a hat box either. Oh, Paul, what are you going to do? I'm going to throw it into the river. Oh, thank heavens Paul realised what it was. You're a very lucky woman, Mrs Russell. I don't have to tell you what would have happened if you hadn't given us a lift. You mean that... That someone planted that thing in my car so that... Exactly. Oh, Mr. Temple, I, I... I just don't know what to say. Don't say anything, Mrs. Russell. I'll move over. I'll drive. Well, thank you for the lift. Thank you. Are you all right? Do you think you can drive? Yes, I, I'm perfectly all right now... I'm afraid I wasn't very cool, calm and collected on that occasion, was I? Have you any idea who planted that thing in the car? No, I haven't. Have you any idea why it was planted there? Oh, I can't imagine. It wasn't exactly a friendly gesture, was it? That rather depends on your friends. Anyway, I'll report the incident to the inspector. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye and thanks again. Walk up, Paul. Don't let's wait for the lift. Yes, all right. Good evening, sir. Can I help you? Oh, good evening. Uh, no, thanks. We're just going up to Miss Nelson's flat. Number three, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but I'm afraid Miss Nelson's out, sir. Out? Are you sure? Well, yes, madam. She went out about ten minutes ago. About ten minutes ago? Yes, sir. Well, that's rather odd. She's expecting us. I can try a flat if you like, sir. She might have come back, but I don't think so, sir. Well, we'll try the flat anyway. Yes. All right, sir. Well, there's no one in. Hmm. Doesn't look like it. I wonder what's happened, Paul. I don't know. What did Macintosh sound like on the telephone? Hmm? Oh, he, he sounded quite bright. Do you think Dinah knew that he was phoning you? No, I don't think she did. Oh, well, you can see what's happened. When he told her that he'd sent for you, she obviously refused... Listen. There is someone in. Yes. Someone's coming. Hello. What's happening? I don't know. But there's someone on the other side of that door. Who is it? Who's there? This is Temple. Who is it? It's Rudolph Charles. I... Well, what is it? What's the matter? I've been shot, Temple. Shot? Well, try to open the door. I can't. Charles, listen. Try to open it. It's locked. The door's locked, Temple. I can't reach it. Paul, he sounds bad. Yes. Get away from the door, Charles. Keep back. Hmm. 
Now, what is it? What's happened? Oh, Paul, look. He's bleeding badly. Oh. I'd better phone for a doctor. I've been shot. I... Temple, listen. I've got to tell you something. It's very important. What is it, Charles? Ferguson is the ring. Paul. I'm afraid he's dead. What was it he said? He said, Ferguson is the ring. That was the sixth episode of Paul Temple and the Jonathan Mystery by Francis Durbridge. The part of Paul Temple was played by Peter Cook and Steve by Marjorie Westbury. The play was produced for the BBC by Martin C. Webster. Episode 7, An Invitation for Mr. Elliot. There's someone on the other side of the door. Who is it? Who's there? This is Temple. Who is that? It's Rudolf Charles. I, I, what is it? What's the matter? I've been shot, Temple. I, I, try to open the door. I can't. I, Charles, listen. Try to open it. It's locked. The door's locked, Temple. I, I can't. Oh, Paul, it sounds bad. Yes. Get away from the door, Charles. Keep back. What is it? What's happened? Oh, Paul, he's, he's bleeding badly. I'd better phone for a doctor. I've been shot. I... I... Temple, listen. I've got to tell you something. It's very important. What is it, Charles? Ferguson is the ring. Paul. I'm afraid he's dead. What was it he said? He said, Ferguson is the ring. Ferguson is the ring? What on earth did he mean? I don't know. Look, Steve, go downstairs and get hold of the porter. Mm -hmm. Don't tell him what happened, but ask him to come up here straight away. Yes, all right. While you're getting the porter, I'll phone Sir Graham. I was just coming down to see you. My husband would like to have a word with you. He's in Miss Nelson's flat. Is anything the matter, madam? Mr. Temple will tell you. Oh, I forgot there's a lady downstairs in the hall. She's waiting for Mr. Temple. Oh? Who is she? Do you know? No, I'm sorry, I don't, madam. Never seen her before. Uh, you go along to the flat. I'll see her. Very well, madam. Mrs. Russell. Where's your husband, Mrs. Temple? I must talk to him. Well, I'm afraid he's busy just now, but... What is it? Why did you come back? Oh, did that business unnerve you? Are you frightened to drive? No, it's not that, but... I changed my mind after what happened tonight. Oh? I think perhaps there are one or two things I ought to tell your husband. Such as? Well, to begin with, I lied about the ring. It wasn't said to me. I wrote the note myself. Oh, you did? You see, I had that ring for some time. Richard gave it to me. Richard gave it to you? Yes. When? Oh, about three months ago. I took him to London for a weekend. We stayed with some friends of mine. 
We did some shows, went to one or two parties, and well, thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. Then, coming back in the car, Richard suddenly kissed me and said he wanted me to have the ring. Well, I didn't want to take it, but I didn't want to hurt his feelings, so... So you took it? Yes. Go on. Well, after the murder, when everyone took it for granted that the dead man was Richard, there was a lot of talk about the missing ring. I nearly took it to the police and explained what had happened, but... You thought if you produced the ring, people would jump to the conclusion that you were implicated. Exactly. When your husband discovered that the dead man was not Richard, everyone said that the murderer had forgotten to complete the job by putting the ring on the dead man. So, you see, whichever way you look at it, I was in a spot. Naturally, I wanted to get rid of the ring. I wanted to hand it over to the police, but I didn't want to take any chances. So you pretended that it had been sent to you? Yes. After I'd given it to your husband, I went home. I hadn't been in the house a quarter of an hour when Richard phoned. He sounded worried. He said he wanted the ring, that he must have it. I told him that I'd given it to your husband. I see. That's the truth, Mrs. Temple. I swear to you it's the truth. Don't you believe me? Yes, I do, Mrs. Russell. But I don't know if my husband will. Yes, but I still don't understand why Macintosh telephoned you and asked you to go back to the flat. Well, there are only two possible explanations, Sir Graham. Mm -hmm. Either Macintosh was telling the truth and Dinah Nelson did quite genuinely want to talk to me, or Macintosh had persuaded Dinah to, well, try and pull the wool over my eyes. Yes, but how do you explain that when you got to the flat, both Miss Nelson and Macintosh were missing? And how does Rudolph Charles fit into the picture? I think Macintosh must have left the flat after he phoned me. But why? Well, probably Dinah sent him away on some pretext or other. And while he was out, Rudolph Charles turned up. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid we shan't really know what happened until you pick up Dinah Nelson or Reggie Macintosh. What about this story of Mrs. Russell's? What do you make of that? I think it's probably true. After all, she did give me the ring and Richard did telephone me shortly afterwards. Yes, but why did young Ferguson ask you to take the ring to Mrs. Gulliver? Why not pick it up from you himself? Well, he knew that if he came to me personally, there was a chance that I'd tip the police off and he'd be picked up. In any case, I'm almost sure that he... Excuse me, Sir Graham. Oh, come in, Inspector. Any luck? Uh, we've picked up Macintosh. We've had no luck with the girl. It's my opinion she's making for town. Have you told the yard? Yes, they're on the lookout for her. Oh, we'll pick her up all right. It's just a matter of time. Where did you find Macintosh? Well, I suppose find is hardly the right word, sir. He's simply turned up. What do you mean? We were taking photographs of Miss Nelson's flat. Foster was going through the usual fingerprint routine. There was a ring at the bell and, well, there was Macintosh. Was he surprised to see you? Very. He was even more surprised when I yanked him down here to the police station. Did you tell him about Rudolph Charles? I didn't tell him anything. How does he seem? Hmm, he seems very worried. He keeps asking for Mr. Temple. Come along, Temple. Let's go down and have a word with him. Did you find the revolver, Inspector? No, we didn't. We've turned the place upside down, but it's not in the flat. Oh, hello, Macintosh. I thought we had an appointment about an hour ago at Miss Nelson's. Mr. Temple, what does this mean? What on earth's going on? Supposing you tell me, Macintosh. What do you mean? Well, didn't you phone me? Didn't you tell me that Miss Nelson was very much better and that you'd finally persuaded her to talk to me? But she did want to talk to you. Really? Look, I think maybe I'd better tell you exactly what happened. Yes, I think perhaps you'd better. Well, after you and Mrs. Temple left the flat with Rudolph Charles, I had a pretty frank talk with Dinah. I told her the best thing she could do was to tell you or Scotland Yard everything she knew about Richard Ferguson, everything she knew about this so-called Mr. Jonathan. How did she take that? Well, she began to get rather hysterical again, and I thought I'd have to send for a doctor. Anyway, I went into the kitchen and made a pot of tea. And when I got back into the bedroom, she seemed much brighter. Mm -hmm. She told me that she'd decided that the best thing she could do was to see you again and make a clean breast of things. Well, naturally, I was very pleased and telephoned you. Go on, Macintosh. Well, when I returned to the bedroom, Dinah said she'd got rather a bad headache and she asked me if I'd go to the chemist and get her some aspirin. And did you? Yes. But the first shop I called at was closed, so I had to walk round the block and almost as far as the bridge. I suppose I was away from the flat about a quarter of an hour. 
Well, when I got back, the flat was empty. Dinah had disappeared. The flat was empty? Yes. Quite empty. Well, there was no one there. Go on, Macintosh. Well, at first I just didn't know what to do. I knew that you'd be coming at any moment and that, to say the least, you'd think it's strange after our phone conversation to find the flat deserted. Yes. Well, suddenly I got it into my head that Dinah might attempt to commit suicide again. I dashed downstairs and ran as far as the river. I thought... Well, I don't have to tell you what I was thinking. But there was no sign of Dinah. I walked into the town, made one or two calls, went to the encounter and then returned to the flat. And you found Inspector Gerard there? I did, much to my surprise. Mr Temple, tell me, has anything happened to Dinah? So far as we know, nothing, beyond the fact that she's disappeared. Then why was the inspector in the flat? They were taking photographs of the place. Macintosh, when you returned to the flat, the first time, I mean, after getting the aspirin, you're quite sure it was empty. Yes, I've told you. There was no sign of Rudolph Charles, for instance. Rudolph? Why, no. Well, if you're telling the truth, Macintosh, shortly after you left the flat for the second time, Rudolph Charles turned up. He was there when Mr. and Mrs. Temple arrived. Rudolph was? Yes. He'd been shot. Shot? I don't believe it. You're lying. You're just trying to trap me. Rudolph Charles is dead. What? He was shot. And it's my opinion, Macintosh, that if you didn't shoot him yourself, then Miss Nelson did. So you must have seen the body of Rudolph Charles when you returned to the flat. I tell you, I didn't. If I'd seen him, I would have... What is it, Inspector? They found Dinah Nelson, sir. Where is she? She's in hospital. What's happened? They pulled her out of the Thames about half an hour ago. So, your guess was right, Mr. Macintosh. Now, do be careful, Mr. Temple, please. Remember, Miss Nelson's extremely overwrought. Yes, Doctor. I'll give you exactly five minutes. I shan't stay a second longer, I promise you. Quite frankly, Mr. Temple, I'm not letting anyone else see her in spite of what Sir Graham says. Mm -hmm. I understand, Doctor. Now, don't forget what I've told you. Who's that? Hello, Dinah. Who is it? Paul Temple. Oh. Oh, Mr. Temple. How are you? How are you feeling, Dinah? I feel better than I did. I... Oh, Mr. Templer, I'm sorry about this. I wouldn't have done it. Now, Dinah, I... listen. I haven't much time. The doctor won't let me stay very long because they want you to rest. Oh. Now, what happened tonight, Dinah? Did you shoot Rudolph Charles? Yes. Yes, I did. Is he dead? Tell me what happened. He came to the flat. I'd sent Reggie out for some aspirin. Rudolph worked for Jonathan, you know. He did? He was one of his right-hand men. He told me that Jonathan wanted me to work for him. Now that Richard was dead, he, he wanted me to take his place. Rudolph said that if I didn't, he would tell the police that I'd thrown suspicion onto Mrs. Russell. Did you? Yes. I sent the magazine to Mr. and Mrs. Ferguson. Why? Oh, well, I... I was jealous of Mavis. I, I thought she was in love with Richard. But, Dinah, when you tried to commit suicide the first time, you left a note for Jonathan. Yes, I know I did. Why? Well, he'd already tried to persuade me to join forces with him. The visit from Rudolph Charles was just... Just was another a... attempt to make you change your mind? Yes. Dinah, tell me, why was Richard Ferguson so keen on getting hold of the signet ring? When he gave the ring to Mavis Russell, he didn't realise then that it was important. Jonathan told him that he must get the ring back. Richard told me about it, and I promised to help him. That's why I was so surprised when you... When I produced the ring? Yes. After I saw you, I, I sent a message to Richard through Mrs. Gulliver telling him that you got the ring. That's why he phoned you. Hmm. Dinah, why did Mrs. Ferguson tell me to get in touch with you? You said you'd never met. I know. I'm sorry. I met her several days ago in London. I told her that I was the person who sent that magazine. She probably guessed that I knew a great deal about Richard. And that's why she told you to get in touch with me. I see. Now, I don't know whether you remember or not, but Mr. McIntosh telephoned me. He said that you were feeling better and that you wanted to talk. 
Yes, I, I did feel better. I, I had a headache, but apart from that, I was all right until... Until Rudolph Charles turned up? Yes. Hmm. Diana, you know what I'm going to ask you, don't you? Oh, please, please don't, Mr Temple, please Who don't. Who is Jonathan? I don't know. You must know, Diana, otherwise... Mr Temple, please, please don't ask me. Diana, listen. I'm pretty sure I know who Jonathan is. So even if you tell me, you're only confirming what I already know. You don't believe me? No. You think I'm bluffing, don't you? Yes, I do. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do, Diana. I'll strike a bargain with you. I'll tell you all I know about this business. I'll tell you why Richard Ferguson was murdered and who murdered him. I'll even tell you who Jonathan is. Well? If I'm right, you need only confirm it. If I'm wrong... Well, I give you my word, I'll never ask you another question about the Jonathan mystery. Is it a deal? Yes. All right. You'll be perfectly honest with me. Yes. Yes, I promise. Right. Well, we'll start at the beginning. It's my opinion that Max Wyman was murdered by Richard Ferguson for the simple reason that young Ferguson... Would you like some more coffee, madam? No, thank you. What about you, darling? No, thanks. But you can bring me some more butter, waiter. Very good, sir. You seem very bright this morning. Ah, I feel very bright. I can't imagine why. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, Steve, I had rather an interesting little bet last night with Dinah Nelson. Oh? I won. I always feel rather pleased with myself when I win. Yes, well, you won't continue to feel rather pleased with yourself if you put your elbow in the marmalade. Hmm? Oh, Lord. <laughs> Messy. Oh, hello. Here's Ferguson. Good morning, Mrs. Temple. Good morning. Morning, Ferguson. Am I interrupting your breakfast? No, no, no. Not at all. Sit down. <sighs> well, uh, Helen and I are leaving for London in about an hour's time. I just thought I'd say goodbye. Mm, we're going back to town ourselves this afternoon, so if there's anything I can do for you, just give me a ring. That's very kind of you, Temple, but as a matter of fact, we've made up our minds to go home. You mean back to the States? Yes, we feel it's kind of pointless just hanging on like this. Whatever happens now can't change the real issue so far as we're concerned. Richard's gone. And all the investigating, all the theories in the world won't bring him back. Yes, I understand. How is Mrs. Ferguson this morning? Oh, she's much better. We had a heart-to-heart -heart talk last night, Mrs. Temple. I think we straightened out a few things. Certainly hope so. What exactly happened last night? Was Elliot telling the truth? Oh, yes, yes, he was. As a matter of fact, there's a perfectly simple explanation. Shortly after she left me to go shopping, Helen met a girl called Dinah Nelson. Well, it appears she was a friend of Richard's. Did your wife know Miss Nelson? Apparently she did, but it was a surprise to me. She met her in London two or three days ago. Anyway, she and Helen started talking, and she told Helen a few home truths about Richard. In fact, I'm afraid she more or less confirmed my opinion of him. She said that Richard had been blackmailing Mark Elliot. He'd already had nearly 2,000 pounds out of him. Well, naturally, Helen was terribly upset. She went straight to the encounter and handed Mr. Elliot a check. I must say, Elliot's been very good about the whole business. What was Richard blackmailing Elliot about, do you know? Well, apparently he had some letters belonging to Elliot. I gather they were not exactly discreet. Have you seen the letters? Oh, yes. After I picked up Helen last night, we went round to Mrs. Gulliver's and collected one or two things that belonged to Richard. Have you still got them? No. As soon as we realized what they were, we handed them over to Elliot. And what about the check? Oh, he took that all right. I insisted. Oh, here is Mrs. Ferguson. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Oh, I was just saying goodbye to Mr. and Mrs. Temple, Helen. Uh, the car's ready, Robert. Okay, what about the cases? They're down. They're just putting them in the car. Well... Goodbye, Mrs. Temple. Goodbye, Mr. Ferguson. When are you actually going back to the States? Oh, we're uh, flying back the day after tomorrow, Mr. Temple. Oh, well, look here. Why don't you drop into the flat tomorrow for a drink? Oh. We should be delighted to see you. Uh, well, I, I'm afraid we've got rather a busy day. Oh, nonsense. You can always find time for a drink. <laughs> Let's say 12.30. <laughs> okay, 12.30. It's a date. See you tomorrow, then. Hmm. Well, au revoir, Mrs. Temple. Au revoir, Mrs. Goodbye. Ferguson. You know, I've just realized something. What's that? I don't know why, but I don't like Mr. Ferguson. 
Fine, Timothy, women are extraordinary. What do you mean, women are extraordinary? <laughs> Pass the toast. Uh, look here. Paul. Pass the toast, Never darling. mind the toast. What do you mean, women are extraordinary? Good morning, Steve. Oh, hello, Sir Graham. Are you seem highly amused, Temple? Yes, I, I am, yes, Sir Graham. He's laughing at one of his own remarks. <laughs> it's a very silly one, too. I simply said women are extraordinary. They are extraordinary, aren't they, Sir Graham? Oh, don't try and drag me into this. <laughs> I'm strictly neutral. <laughs> <laughs> well, sit down and have some coffee. Uh, no, thanks. Steve, I, I want you to take a good look at these photographs. What are they, Sir Graham? Have you seen this man before? Oh, yes. Paul, look. Why, yes, he's the fellow who impersonated Max Wyman. Mm. Are you sure? Positive. Good. Now, what about this fellow? No, I don't recognise him. No, wait a minute, Steve. Isn't he the character that let us into Mrs. Gulliver's? He was using the vacuum cleaner and he said he worked for a domestic help service of some sort. Yes, yes, I think you're right, darling. You sure, Temple? Yes, I'm pretty sure. Good. We picked them up this morning. Both of them? Both of them. Oh, oh yes, we can move fast, <laughs> Temple, when we want to. Yes, I know, that's a Graham. Well, what happened? I haven't got the details yet. Gerard phoned me about an hour ago. They picked them up in an amusement arcade just off the Tottenham Court Road. Oh. Were they together? Yes. Who are they, Sir Graham? Well, the one who impersonated Wyman used to be in the confidence racket. His name's James, Ed James. He's a first-class driver. He did pretty well in one of the Monte Carlo railways. Is that so? And the other fellow? Oh, that's clearly a very different type. He's really vicious. We've been wanting to pin something on that gentleman for a very long time. Oh, incidentally, he was a friend of Red Harris's. Clegley was? Yes. Sir Graham, do you think Red Harris and James and this man, Clegley, actually worked for Jonathan? Yes. Jonathan has got a pretty big hold on the car racket. It's my opinion that men like James and Clegley actually steal the cars and men like Red Harris fence them. Well, then, why did they get rid of Red Harris? He must have been a pretty important part of the setup. I should imagine that someone told Jonathan that I'd been in touch with Red. Yes, they probably knew that Red owed you a favour, Temple, and they weren't taking any chances. Mm. <laughs> well, how did young Ferguson fit into the picture? Well, I think that he must have acted as a, as a sort of liaison for Jonathan. Mm -hmm. In other words, it was his job to make certain that the cars which were stolen were actually passed over to the organisation and not sold independently. Well, I suppose that explains the card he had. Yes, the card gave him the two numbers, the genuine number and the number he had to change over to. In other words, if... Yes, what is it? Excuse me, sir. Mm -hmm. There's a gentleman to see you, sir, a Mr Elliot. Mr Elliot? Yes, sir, he's waiting for you in the lounge, sir. Oh, good, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now, what does Elliot want, I wonder... I'll see you upstairs, darling. Yes, all right, Paul. Are you packed? Well, I shall be by the time you're ready. Goodbye, Sir Graham. Goodbye, Steve. What time are you leaving, Temple? Oh, not till this afternoon. I should imagine we'll get off about three. Oh, splendid. You can give me a lift. Fine. Shall we pick you up at the police station? No, or... no, no, no. I'll be here. Oh, Sir Graham, did you um, speak to them at the hospital about... Yes, I did. I'm afraid it wasn't easy. Oh, I didn't think it would be. Still, don't worry. It's fixed. Good. Oh, hello, Elliot. Sorry to have kept you waiting. Uh, th that's all right, Temple. I hope I haven't interrupted your breakfast. No, we've just finished. Well, you're nice and early this morning. Uh, yes, I'm just on my way to London. I've got an early luncheon appointment. Well, what can I do for you? Well, you remember I told you about Richard Ferguson blackmailing me and about the, the, the letters I wrote? Yes, I remember. Well, look here, Temple... If you catch the person that murdered Richard Ferguson, does that mean I shall have to get up in court and tell the whole story? You mean about Ferguson blackmailing you? Yes. Well, it depends entirely on who murdered Ferguson and what the motive was. You may not have to get up in court at all. I see. I don't think you do see. At least, if you do, you don't look very happy about it. Look, if anyone claims, in court or anywhere else, that I had a motive for murdering Richard Ferguson, I shall deny it. In spite of what I've already told you, I shall deny it. So Ferguson was telling the truth. What do you mean? You've got the letters back? Yes. Oh, well, if you've got them back, so far as I can see, there's nothing for you to worry about. Unless the police fail to find the person who murdered Ferguson and pick on me as a sort of scapegoat. If the police don't think you murdered Ferguson, they won't pick on you. Anyway, I've got a shrewd suspicion that the police already know who murdered Ferguson. Oh? Look, Elliot, I'm afraid you'll have to excuse me. I've got rather a lot to do, and I'm going back to town myself this afternoon. Oh, yes, of course. 
Oh, by the way, mm-hmm. I was awfully sorry to hear about Dinah Nelson. Yes, it was a nasty business. I very much doubt if she'll get over it. Get over it? Haven't you heard? What do you mean? Dinah Nelson's dead. What? I telephoned the hospital about half an hour ago. She died this morning. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Sir Graham will be sorry, too. He intended to have a talk with her this morning. Did anyone see her last night? No, it was quite out of the question. She was unconscious. Oh, I see. Well, I'd better be making a move. Oh, by the way, Elliot, how long are you going to be in town? Oh, two or three nights. Well, I'd like to see you again. Drop in the flat sometime. You'll find my address in the book. Well, thanks very much. As a matter of fact, we're having a few friends in tomorrow, I think, about midday. Just for a drink. Drop in then, if you like. I'd like to. Fine. Well, see you tomorrow. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, that's enough, Paul. You're shaking the ice all over the place. <laughs> Give me your glass, Mrs. Ferguson. Uh, Not for me, thanks. Two's my limit. Oh, come on, nonsense. Charlie? Yes, sir? We want another bottle of gin. Very good, sir. You'll find one in the kitchen, Charlie. Okie dokie, Mrs. Temple. Ferguson? Well, uh, just a spot, I guess. There. Nice. Steve? Thank you, darling. Well, cheers. Down the hatch. Cheers. Well, I hope you have a pleasant trip back to the States, Mrs. Ferguson. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Temple. Oh, thank goodness, the, the weather there looks quite promising. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Temple? Yes? There's something I wanted to say before we go. Uh, there's uh, something we both want to say. Uh, Temple, I lost my temper the other day when Sir Graham was questioning us, but... but we, uh, don't, we don't want you to think that we're not grateful. Grateful for what? Well, you've worked very hard on this case, Temple, and... We'd like you to know that just because you haven't got any results, it doesn't mean now, to say... Now, wait a minute, that... wait a minute. What sort of results were you expecting? Well, we were hoping that you'd find out who murdered Richard. Oh, but I know who murdered Richard. Wh- what? Are, are you serious? I also know why Richard wanted the signet ring, why the body of Max Wyman was found in your son's flat, and I also know the identity of Jonathan. What? You... You know who Jonathan is. Temple, is this a joke? No, it's no joke, Ferguson. As a matter of fact, I've invited Jonathan here, to the flat, this morning. You don't really mean that. Excuse me, sir. Yes, what is it, Charlie? Uh, Mr. McIntosh to see you, sir. That was the seventh episode of Paul Temple and the Jonathan Mystery by Francis Durbridge. The part of Paul Temple was played by Peter Cook and Steve by Marjorie Westbury. The play was produced for the BBC by Martin C. Webster. Episode 8, Jonathan. I also know why Richard wanted the signet ring... Why the body of Max Wyman was found in your son's flat. And I know who Jonathan is. What? You know who Jonathan is? Temple, is this a joke? No, it's no joke, Ferguson. As a matter of fact, I've invited Jonathan here, to the flat, this morning. Uh, You're not serious. Excuse me, sir? Yes, what is it, Charlie? Uh, Mr. McIntosh to see you, sir. Ah, come in, McIntosh, come in. I got your note this morning, Mr. Temple, so I thought... No, delighted to see you, my dear fellow. 
Uh, don't forget the gin, Charlie. Very good, sir. Uh, good morning, Mrs. Temple. Good morning, Mr. McIntosh. Look, Temple, I don't want to be rude, but I think you owe us an explanation. An explanation? Yes. Just before McIntosh arrived, you made a oh, startling mistake. Oh, I'm so state. sorry, McIntosh. Uh, do you know Mr. and Mrs. Ferguson? Why, oh, no, I don't think we've met. Mr. I Temple, do. please, do you really know who murdered Richard? Uh, yes, Charlie? Uh, Mr. Elliot, sir. Ah, come in, Elliot. Good morning, Temple. Sorry I'm a little late. Why, hello, Ferguson. Good morning, Mrs. Ferguson. Good morning. I think you've met Mr. McIntosh. Uh, yes, of course. I, I was sorry to hear about your sister. And Look, McIntosh. Temple, I don't want to be rude, but... you've but... said that before, Mr. Ferguson. Is uh, anything the matter? Have we interrupted something, Mr. Temple? Just before you arrived, Temple made an extraordinary statement. My wife and I want an explanation. We must certainly do. Well, what did you say, Mr. Temple? Yes. What was this shattering statement of yours? Tell them, Ferguson. He said he knew who murdered Richard. What? Not only that, but he said that he knew the identity of Jonathan and that he was actually coming here to this flat this morning. Did you say that? Is it true, Mr. Temple? Well, do sit down. Well, I think the best thing I can do is begin at the beginning. This isn't going to be very pleasant, Ferguson, so far as you and your wife are concerned. That's but... all right, Temple. Don't spare our feelings. You go ahead. Well... For a very long time now, there's been a set-up in this country dealing in stolen cars. The set-up is controlled by a person called Jonathan. Richard Ferguson worked for him. But one day, for reasons which we won't go into at the moment, Richard suddenly decided that he wanted to drop the whole business. He knew it was no good talking to Jonathan. You mean he decided to eliminate Max Wyman and give Jonathan and everyone else the impression that he, Ferguson, had been murdered? Exactly. I see. He'd always hated Wyman because Wyman mistrusted him. He knew that there was a strong resemblance between Max Wyman and himself. People had frequently mistaken them for each other. Ferguson felt pretty sure that he'd get away with a murder, provided he disfigured Wyman, dressed him up in his clothes, and faked the fingerprints. So he invited Wyman to his flat and... Well, you know what happened. Yes. Unfortunately, however, young Ferguson... Forgot the signet ring. What do you mean, Macintosh? forgot the signet ring? Well, he forgot to put his ring on the dead man. Well, that's true, isn't it? No. I'm afraid it isn't. No? No. Ferguson hadn't got the ring. He'd given it to Mrs. Russell. Oh. But quite a lot of people thought the same as you, Macintosh, including Red Harris. Except that Red thought that Jonathan actually helped young Ferguson to murder Wyman and that they had both forgotten the ring. Yes, this is all very interesting, Temple, but you said you knew the identity of Jonathan. I do. As a matter of fact, he's here. Now. In this very room. Jonathan is? Yes. What? But he can't be here. Unless... Well, what are you looking at me like that for? Don't you know why, Macintosh? Temple, you surely don't think I'm Jonathan. Aren't you? Oh, you're mad. Completely mad. Paul, look out. Stand back. Stand back, everybody. Oh. Put that gun down, Macintosh. Do you hear me? Put it down. I warn you, Temple. One step more, and by God, I'll... Oh, don't! That's better. Now, stand over there, near Ferguson. Sorry to have been so long, Mr. Temple. I had a bit of a job finding... Drop that chin. bottle. Hello, what's going on here? You heard what I said. Drop that bottle. Drop it, Charlie. Now, stand over there, next to Mrs. Temple. You heard me. Do as he tells you, Charlie. Go on, get moving. Okay. Now listen, I warn you, if anybody moves, if anybody tries any tricks, you've had it. Don't anyone move. He means it. Have you got the key to this door, Temple? It's in the lock on the outside. Open the door, Mrs. Temple. Open it, Steve. Now, go back into the room. You fool, Macintosh. You don't think you're going to get away with this, do you? We'll see, Temple. We'll see. He's locked it, Mr. Temple. Temple, what are we going to do? Phone for the police. We'd better break the lock, Temple. Otherwise, he'll have a good start on us. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. He won't have a start on anybody. What do you mean? Sir Graham's downstairs with Inspector Gerard in half Scotland Yard. If he gets as far as the hall, he'll be lucky. Paul, listen. Macintosh, give me that gun. Come along, Macintosh, Macintosh. Leave me alone! Leave me alone! I want you, I'll fire! Don't you fool! I'll fire! Can't we get out and, and see what's happened? Quiet, there's someone coming. 
Who's there? Oh, Sir Graham. Did you get him? What happened? What happened, Sir Graham? He's dead. Macintosh? Yes. He shot himself. Speak to Mr. Mark Elliott, please. Who's it calling? Mrs. Temple. Oh, one moment, please. Hello? Mrs. Temple on the line, sir. Oh, oh, thank you. Hello? Good morning, Mrs. Temple. Oh, good morning, Mr. Elliott. I'm sorry if I disturbed you. Not at all. I've been up for hours. I've been reading the papers. There doesn't appear to be anything about Macintosh. No, there doesn't. Well, I'm glad, for the Ferguson's sake. Mr. Elliott... I rather wanted to talk to you. Do you think we could meet sometime this afternoon? I know you're a frightfully busy man. Well, I have an appointment at five o'clock, but look, uh, let's say 3.30. Oh, 3.30 would do beautifully. Perhaps we could have tea together. Yes, I, I don't see why not. Oh, lovely. I'll see you at the Ritz in the hall about uh, 3.30. Yes, all right. It's very sweet of you. Not at all. Delighted. Oh, by the way, what is it you wanted to see me about? I'll tell you this afternoon, Mr. Elliot. Goodbye. Well done, Steve. Perfect. <laughs> Next week, Cleopatra. <laughs> what did he say? I'm having tea with him this afternoon. But don't ask me why. I'll brief you later, Steve. Don't worry. What do you mean, brief me? What's got into you this morning? You were up half the night, and yet you seem so... Yes? What is it, Charlie? Sir Graham Forbes is here, madam. Ah, come in, Sir Graham. Come in. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Sir Graham. Well... I think you're going to be wrong, Temple. I don't think so. Well, it's beginning to look like it. Frankly, I'm worried. Um, did you telephone Mrs. Russell? I saw her. You saw her? When? Last night, after the Macintosh incident. Paul went back to Oxford, Sir Graham. He didn't get home till half past four this morning. Mm -hmm. What did you say? Well, I put my cards on the table and told her... Qu oh, excuse me. Hello? Mr. Temple? Oh, uh, hello, Mrs. Russell. Uh, I did what you suggested. Well? He's made an appointment, five o'clock this afternoon. Good. Uh, did he say anything else? No, he was non-committal, but I think he was interested. Thank you, Mrs. Russell. You uh, don't really want me to keep that appointment, do you? No, no, we'll keep it for you. Thanks very much, Mrs. Russell. Uh, I'm going away for two or three weeks. If, if you want to get in touch with me... Oh, don't worry. If we want you, we'll find you. Goodbye, Mr. Temple, and thanks for everything. Not at all. Goodbye. Well, he made an appointment to see her this afternoon at five o'clock. Elliot said he had an appointment at five, Paul. How do you know, Steve? She spoke to Elliot on the phone, Sir Graham. As a matter of fact, she's having tea with him this afternoon. Oh, is she? Now, listen, Steve. When you see Elliot this afternoon, this is what I want you to do. Of course, if you do stick to one colour, it's far more economical. I remember one year I wore nothing but grey. Really? Mm. By the end of the season, I was positively dying for something gay and exotic. Yes, yes, I'm sure you were. Uh, are you sure you wouldn't like another cake, Mrs. Temple? Oh, quite sure, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Temple, what exactly is it you wanted to see me about? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. How stupid of me. <laughs> you know, I'd almost forgotten. My husband asked me to give you a message, Mr. Elliot. Oh? He couldn't come himself. He had an appointment at half past three and another at five o'clock, so it was quite... Oh, oh, you've got an appointment at five, haven't you? Yes, I have. Oh, I hope I'm not going to make you late for it. Oh, no, 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 no. It's uh, only just four. Oh, good. Uh, Mrs. Temple, you still haven't told me. Told you what? What you wanted to see me about. Oh, but I did. Just now. My husband asked me to deliver a message. Yes, but what was the message? Oh, of course. He said, tell Mr. Elliot, the game's up. The game's up? Yes. What's he mean? Oh, I'm afraid I don't know. That's just the message I was asked to deliver. Did your husband say anything else? No, except that he insisted that I had tea with you down here instead of up in your room. He what? Oh, that was only because he knew that there'd be a telephone in your room and he didn't want you to use it. Didn't want me to use it? Mm. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm afraid I just don't understand. Well, you see, Paul thought that once you saw our friend, you, you might want to telephone someone and uh, well, that's the last thing he wanted you to do. Our friend? What are you talking about? Well, our friend over there, of course, in the corner. 
I, I don't see anyone. Oh, come. Look carefully, Mr. Elliot. In the corner, near the pillar. Good Lord. It's Macintosh. Yes. It's Macintosh. Yes. But I, I, I thought he was dead. Whatever gave you that idea? But he shot himself. I heard the shot. We all heard the shot. He couldn't very well shoot himself with a blank cartridge now, could he? You mean the whole thing was a put-up job? How much does your husband know, Mrs. Temple? Quite a lot, I should imagine. Of course, he doesn't tell me everything. You know what husbands are. Now, you listen to me, Mrs. Temple. You let go of my arm. You'll tell me exactly what's behind all this. You'll let, tell me why you me came here this me, afternoon sir. and... Why... Mr. Elliot. Yes, what do you want? I'm Inspector Gerard, sir, and this is Sergeant Bowman. Well? We've a warrant for your arrest, Mr. Elliot. My, my, my arrest? Yes, sir. It looks as if you'll be wearing grey this season, Mr. Elliot. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. I believe you have a Mr. and Mrs. Ferguson staying here. Uh, yes, sir. Suite 103. Well, would you bring Mr. Ferguson, please, and say that Mrs. Russell has arrived? Uh, Mrs. Russell? Yes. But, uh... My name is Forbes of Scotland Yard. This is Paul Temple, Inspector Gerard, Sergeant Wilson. Oh, uh, uh, Oh, I see. Uh, I think perhaps you'd better see Mr. Milson, the manager, sir, just Just in case. ring Mr. Ferguson and tell him that Mrs. Russell has arrived. That's all we want you to do. Very good, sir. Well? There doesn't appear to be a reply, sir. Keep ringing. I yes, sir. There's no reply, sir. I'm sorry. What is it, Desmond? Uh, these gentlemen are asking for Mr. Ferguson, sir. The Fergusons checked out about an hour ago. Checked out? Yes. Did they take their luggage? Yes, of course, sir. They're leaving on the six o'clock plane for New York. Okay, Helen? Yes. Now remember what I told you. I shall be all right. When we get on the plane. Sure. May I see your passport, please? Oh, certainly. Have you got much English money on you, Mr. Ferguson? No, only a shilling or two. Uh, Mrs. Ferguson? No, no, nothing. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, one moment, Mr. Ferguson, please. Yes, sir, what is it? Would you come this way, please, sir? The immigration officer would like to have a word with you. Oh, surely. I won't be a moment, Helen. All right, Robert. This way, please, sir. Thank you. Why, hello, Temple, Sir Graham. Thank you, officer. Thank you, sir. Well, this is a surprise. I certainly didn't expect to find you two at the airport. Well, if it comes to that, we didn't expect to find you here either. You cancelled your hotel reservations this morning. That's right, I did. But we thought you intended to stay over here for a couple of days. Well, so we did, but, uh, <laughs> say, you boys are pretty well informed. What happened, Ferguson? Uh, Helen suddenly changed her mind again and decided that she wanted to go home at once. <laughs> you know what women are. Why did you change your mind? Was it because Mark Elliot phoned you? Well, why should he make me change my mind? My wife phoned Elliot this morning at my request and made an appointment to see him this afternoon. Well? It's my bet Elliot told you about that appointment. And you decided to play safe after all and return to the States. Play safe? Say... What is this? It was your original intention to see Mrs. Russell this afternoon at five o'clock. You meant to ask her to join your organization. What organization? Diana Nelson talked, Ferguson. In fact, she's still talking. Still talking? You're crazy. Diana's dead. Oh, no, she's not. What? Elliot thought she was dead. The hospital told him so. But you can take it from me, she's very much alive. As much alive as Macintosh, in fact. D do you mean that Macintosh didn't commit suicide? I think we'd better let Elliot tell you about Macintosh. I understand he got quite a shock when he saw him this afternoon. We've arrested Elliot, and he'll talk, Ferguson. I shouldn't have any illusions on that score. Well, he can talk till he's blue in the face. But but he, he was in this business just, just as much as me or anyone else. It was Elliot that handled the distribution side. He gave Richard his instructions... He told Red Harris what to do, and he made Clegley murder Mrs. Gulliver's so that... We know all that, Ferguson. 
But you were the brains behind the setup. You started it. You made all the contacts. You were Jonathan. How long have you known, Temple? Some little time. But I just wasn't certain. Then, as Rudolph Charles died, he said something which confirmed my suspicions. I see. Temple, there are two things I want you to know. One, my wife wasn't mixed up in this business. Towards the end, she got suspicious and started making inquiries, but believe me, she wasn't mixed up in it. Go on. Secondly, I'm a gambler. I've been a gambler all my life, Temple. I know when I'm beaten. What is it, Ferguson? I... Is it your heart again? Yes. You'd better sit down. I'll be all right. It'll pass. It's just the suspense of waiting and wondering if... Temple, my wife's got some tablets of mine. They're in her handbag. Do you think you could get one for me? They usually do the trick. Yes, all right, Ferguson. There's um, a settee over there, Ferguson. I think you'd better lie down. No, I'm better sitting up. I... Oh, oh, gee, this is one of the worst attacks I've had for some time. Do you think I could have a drink of water? Yes, there's some water on the desk. I'll get it for you. Thanks. Here we are. Thanks. Is that better? Oh, I think it's easing off a little. But, oh, dear. Uh, did you get the tablet, Temple? Yes. Here it is, Ferguson. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Feeling better? Well, in a few minutes. Did my wife say anything, Temple? No, she just gave me the tablet. Is she okay? Yes, yeah, she's all right. Is the tablet having any effect? It will, Sir Graham. Don't worry. It will. What do you mean, Ferguson? I told you I was a gambler, didn't I? I told you I knew when to throw in my chips. Yes, well, I'm not a gambler. Here's the tablet your wife gave me. Huh? You took an aspirin. Mm. Hey, Timothy, I feel tired tonight. Yes, well, you'd better not feel too tired. You've both got some explaining to do. Huh? What do you mean, explaining, Steve? Well, in the first place, I just don't understand why Macintosh pretended he was Jonathan. That was my brainwave, Steve. Since it worked, I take the credit for it. <laughs> Actually, the idea was to lull Ferguson into a feeling of complete security. I put the idea to Macintosh, and he agreed to help us. We did very much the same sort of thing over Dinah Nelson. You mean about the hospital? Yes. When Elliot telephoned them, he was told that Dinah had died. Later the same morning, Temple assured him that no one had actually spoken to Dinah. So he felt on pretty safe ground? Very safe ground. So much so, in fact, that he decided to stay on and form the nucleus of a new organisation with Elliot. Mm -hmm. I told Mrs Russell to phone Ferguson and suggest a meeting at the hotel and give him a pretty broad hint that she was hard up and might be prepared to join the new setup. Ferguson was rather worried about her. He knew she'd been very friendly with Richard, and he wasn't sure just how much she knew. Well, as you know, Sir Graham and I kept the appointment instead of Mrs Russell. But, of course, the Fergusons had already left for the airport. Yes, but, look, how did this business first start? Well, Ferguson was running the stolen car racket, mm -hmm. and he employed a number of people, including Red Harris, Rudolph Charles, Mrs Gulliver, Richard Ferguson, and so on. His right-hand man was Mark Elliot. Mm -hmm. Now, several months ago, a man called Duma contacted Ferguson. Oh, he was the man running the car racket on the continent, um, A4, D4. Uh -huh. That's mm -hmm. right. And he thought he'd like to tie up with the Jonathan organisation. He probably wanted sterling or dollars. So he wrote Ferguson a friendly note and sent him a present. The present was the signet ring. Ah. Duma told Ferguson he was taking no chances 
and that when they did meet, Ferguson or his appointed deputy must wear the ring as a means of identification. I see. But things suddenly began to get very hot for Dumas, and the meeting was postponed. Ferguson then gave the ring to Richard without telling him how important it was. But Richard gave the ring to Mavis Russell. Well, that was rather silly of him. Mm -hmm. Yes, and when Ferguson arrived in England and discovered that his son had apparently been murdered and that the ring was missing, he felt sure that Elliot was double-crossing him. He thought that Elliot had murdered Richard and, and stolen the ring. Yes, but of course Richard had decided to get out of the car racket. He phoned his father and explained what had happened. Ferguson was furious and told him he must get the ring back. And explained why. He was also worried in case someone had overheard that phone call from a man supposed to be dead. So, to cover himself, he told me Richard had phoned him. And they made up the story about Richard wanting to meet him at the house in Lewisham. Knowing, of course, that he wasn't at the house. And that Red Harris had been taken care of. Oh, yes, well, that was the night that Ferguson had the heart attack and we went in his place. Uh -huh. But, Paul, was Richard Ferguson blackmailing Elliot? No, of course he wasn't. Elliot invented that blackmailing story to explain his association with young Ferguson. Well, actually, Elliot convinced Jonathan that he'd nothing to do with the missing ring and promised that if Ferguson and his wife supported his blackmailing story, he'd do his best to get the ring back. In fact, he did get it back. He stole it from your husband the night you went to the encounter. Yes, but why did he give it us back the next morning? Because Duma had been arrested the night before. I see. I think. <laughs> oh, this is complicated. But, yeah, I think I've got it. Well, not knowing that Duma was arrested, Richard still thought the ring was important and got in touch with Temple. Elliot followed young Ferguson out in his car and stopped him. There was an argument and Ferguson was shot. By Elliot? Yes. After the murder, Elliot parked the car by the side of the road, dashed to the AA box and phoned Clegley. And Clegley was the man who murdered Mrs. Gulliver? Yes. He told Clegley what had happened and asked him to take care of the body. He certainly did. He set the car on fire. Elliot was taking no chances. He'd made up his mind to eliminate anybody who was likely to talk. Mrs. Gulliver, Mavis Russell... Oh, yes, the, the bomb in the car. Yes, that's right. And Dinah Nelson. It was Rudolph Charles who was given the job of disposing of Dinah, but fortunately she turned the tables on him. But, Paul, if she killed Rudolph Charles, Macintosh must have seen the body. He did. He did? When he returned with the aspirin, he found Dinah standing over Charles with a revolver in her hand. He disposed of the revolver and told Dinah to get out of Oxford as quickly as she could. She didn't, of course. She tried to commit suicide. But what about the postcard that she had from Jonathan? It was phony, Steve. Jonathan knew that we had one genuine card, the card sent to young Ferguson. The others were just meant to put us off the scent. Well, did Macintosh know that Rudolph Charles was a, a member of the Jonathan set up? No, he didn't. When we explained the position to him, he told us the truth about the Charles murder and agreed to cooperate with us. Hmm. Well, there's just one other point. Before hmm. Rudolph Charles died, he said, Ferguson is the ring. What did he mean by that? What he tried to say was, Ferguson, meaning Robert Ferguson, Ferguson is the ring leader. The ring leader? Mm. Do you know, I never thought of that. No, and your dear husband only thought of it 24 hours after Rudolf Charles <laughs> said it. <laughs> yes, but I did think of it, Sir Graham. Yes, yes. <laughs> <sighs> well... That's the end of the Jonathan mystery. Yes, Carol. thank goodness. And I want to celebrate it. Steve, where's the bottle of champagne? Oh, here we are. Oh, you're not going to open champagne at this time, oh, I certainly am. It's precisely what I'm going to do. This is an occasion, darling. A festive occasion. <laughs> ah. Oh. Sir Graham, your glass. Well, thank you, Temple. Steve, come on, darling. Come on. I'm coming. Now, I'm going to make a toast. You're going to do nothing of the sort. Hmm? I'm the oldest member of this trio, and if anyone's going to make a toast, I'm going to make it. To my very dear friends, Paul Temple and Steve. What's the matter, darling? I think I'm going to cry. <laughs> my Timothy women are extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> That was the final episode of Paul Temple and the Jonathan Mystery. 
The part of Paul Temple was played by Peter Cook and Steve by Marjorie Westbury. Robert Ferguson by John Glenn, Helen Ferguson by Griselda Harvey, Reggie McIntosh by Simon Lack, Mavis Russell by Isabel Rennie and Mark Elliott by William Fox. The serial was written by Francis Durbridge and produced for the BBC by Martin C. Webster.